much weaker, of course, which is to say you can have in whatever you like apart from these 300 items on the so-called goods review list. So the trade sanctions part of this, which we know he'd been breaking under the previous regime, was not a peripheral but an essential part of that sanctions framework being valid. And so the problem was, I mean, it, it, an accurate summary of the position, I don't think anyone could really dispute this at the time, is that containment through sanctions had basically been eroding. We now had a new sanctions framework, but this new sanctions framework, to get it through the UN, had been watered down in okay. the absolutely vital component of the trade restrictions. And I, I don't know whether it's, it's, it's maybe worth actually sending you that there's a book um, by someone called Ken Pollock, who, who has written specifically on the sanctions uh, framework um, and Saddam. And what he does when he comes to this so-called smart sanctions is he said there were seven preconditions for smart sanctions to work, and then he goes on to explain why none of them would actually have happened. So I think... Let's, let's just summarise that then, and by all means send us the book, please. We, we have no shortage of material to read, but we're always ready for more. Um, containment, therefore, is a policy that is in question at this point. You're clearly, as Prime Minister, in the first half of 2002, not very, you're, and based on the advice coming to you, uh, you're not very happy about the way it's working. Um, so what are your other strategic options at this point, and by what process did you review what your options were? Well, that's the reason we call for the options uh, paper. I mean, the options were basically these. We had taken a decision post-September the 11th that this issue had to be confronted, um, and there are a number of different ways it could be confronted. It can be confronted by an effective sanctions um, framework. It can be confronted by Saddam allowing the inspectors back in to do their work properly um, and compliance with the UN resolutions. Or, um, in the final analysis, if he was not prepared, if sanctions could not contain him and he was not prepared to allow the UN inspectors back in, then the option of removing Saddam was there. And that option, incidentally, had always been there after September the 11th, what changed, as I say, was our calculation, mine and I think the Americans as well, that, that we couldn't go on like this. So the options paper looked, as you say, at containment, strengthened as one broad course, an alternative strategy, possibility of regime change, which by then was being much talked about in the United States, and then three different ways in which that might be affected. And I don't want to go into each of those at this, this particular point. I'm, as I say, trying to think about the process of formulating strategy. Having got that paper, um, what did you do in order to have it discussed and reviewed and looked at? What kind of meetings did you hold about it? Who did you consult? Well, obviously, we were talking. Um, I was speaking very closely with, with Jack Straw, um, with those who were um, advising me at the time. Um, we were talking, obviously, to the Minister of Defence people and the Defence Secretary as well. And we were trying to get an assessment. That's why, as I say, there was a lot of discussion inside government. Is, is this, is this um, new sanctions framework really going to do it or not? Is it going to be effective? And as I say, I think the conclusion was, in the end, y you certainly couldn't rely Did on it. Did you have an actual meeting to discuss the paper and take a decision on it? Well, we had a, a meeting, I think, um, the options paper was given to us before the meeting with President Bush, and then I think, I'm not sure whether it was before or shortly after, but I can look it out for you. I think we then had a, a meeting the key people to decide um, where we were then going to go. Um, and I think you got the paper in March. You were seeing President Bush in April, and before you went to see President Bush, you had a meeting at Chequers mm -hmm. with, a uh, with a number of people, which was a sort of briefing meeting for Crawford. But you didn't have anything like a cabinet committee meeting that looked at this paper and had a sort of structured debate about it. Well, we did have a very structured debate with the, with the people. I mean, the fact that it happened at Chequers rather than Downing Street, I don't think is particularly relevant to it. But I, th I think. The simple answer is, did we consider those other options? Absolutely. That's why we, we had the paper drawn up. And when you consider those options, how diverse was the range of advice you were getting on them? Were you getting advice fed into you from people with a real knowledge of the Middle East and Iraq? And were you having people 
challenging the paper and pointing out that some of the possible downsides if you went this way or that way? The, the one thing I've, I've found throughout this, um, throughout this whole matter from a very early stage is that I was never short of people challenging me on it. So can you identify who, who they were? Well, there were people within the cabinet, obviously. Um, for example, Robin Cook and from time to time Claire Short. Would... But they weren't at the Chequers meeting? No, they weren't, but we would discuss this. We discussed, obviously, prior to um, the invasion of Iraq, I think there mm. were no fewer than 24 different cabinet meetings. This was, this was a topic that was right through the mainstream. But you didn't of discuss UK the politics. options paper in cabinet? We didn't discuss the options paper specifically in Cabinet, but it we certainly didn't discussed... It didn't go to the Cabinet. I mean, the, Claire Short didn't get a paper. She complained that she hadn't got it in the first place. Yes, but the, the discussion that we had in Cabinet was a substantive discussion. We had it again and again and again. And the options were very simple. You know, the, the options were a sanctions framework that was effective. Alternatively, the UN inspectors mm -hmm. doing the job. Alternatively, you have to remove Saddam. Those were the options. And what were the downside arguments being put to you about removing Saddam? Well, the downside arguments, and this was partly from, for example, you know, I was reading telegrams coming in from ambassadors abroad and so on. The downside arguments were obviously going to be that not merely is military action always something that you should consider only as a last resort, but there were issues to do with relationships in the Muslim world. There were issues to do with what the effect would be in the Arab world and so on. But what you find in these situations is that you will get a range of different views. Some people were saying, you must not, on no account, contemplate military action. Other people were saying, it's time you acted. And so, for example, in, I think it was in mid-2002, the Conservative Party put out a paper saying, you know, this is why Saddam is a threat and we have to act. Other people were saying, I think the Liberal Democrats were saying, he may be a threat, but you should rule out military action. So it's not as if we weren't getting um, the full range of views. We, we, we got the full range of views from the very beginning. The trouble was we had to take a decision. And my decision was that we could not afford to have this situation go on. How we then dealt with it, however, was an open question. Were the views being put to you, did they include people warning you that what happened <coughs> after you toppled Saddam Hussein, if one did end up doing that, would raise some difficult questions and risks of sectarian strife within Iraq. How, how much was that spelt out in the advice from that time? Most of the advice was, was a worry about a humanitarian catastrophe mm -hmm. if Saddam was removed. Um, there was advice, and I actually called for papers on this, I think a little bit later, on what the Sunni-Shia relationship would be. And that was obviously an issue. It was an issue we raised. Um, within our own deliberations with the Americans and elsewhere. Um, and all of these things were factors that we had to take into account. But the primary consideration for me was to send an absolutely powerful, um, clear, and unremitting message that after September the 11th, if you were a regime engaged in WMD, you had to stop. Well, that brings me, I think, to the final points that I want to ask, because from the evidence that we've heard so far from now a large number of witnesses and from the documents we've read, it does begin to appear that by about March or April of 2002, you were strongly attracted to the idea of, of changing the regime in Iraq. And in a sense, in doing so, you were building on a philosophy of humanitarian intervention that you had first, I think, set out in a, in a very public way in your Chicago speech of April 1999. Uh, and you, in April, of course, of 2002, after your meeting with President Bush, <coughs> returned to it in your speech at the George Bush Presidential Library at College Station when you said, talking in general of regime change, not specifically in this paragraph about Iraq, if necessary, the action should be military, and again, if necessary and justified, it should involve regime change. <laughs> I have been involved as British Prime Minister in three conflicts involving regime change, Milosevic, the Taliban, and Sierra Leone. Um, 
had you reached the point where you regarded within this philosophy removing Saddam's regime, and I don't think anybody was ever in any doubt about the evilness of Saddam's regime, as a valid objective for the government's policy? Um, no, the absolutely key issue was the WMD issue. But I think it's just worth it at this point, and then I'll come specifically to the Texas speech and deal with this, this, this notion that somehow in Crawford uh, I, I, I shifted our position. Well, we'll talk about Crawford separately. I'm okay. sticking on the strategy now. Right, sorry, I thought you, you were referring to the I was, I was to referring to the speech. I'm referring right. to the specifically... But it wasn't that the day after the Crawford meeting? It was the day after the Crawford yeah. meeting, and it's in the context of your right. philosophy of regime change. OK. Let me make it quite clear. In the Chicago speech in... Um, 1999. What I was doing was setting out very clearly what I thought the consequences were of an interdependent world. And what I was really saying was this, that whereas in the past people might have thought that a security problem in one part of the world can be divorced from its impact on another part, in the world that was developing, we were no longer able to do that, not financially, not in terms of security, not in terms actually of the cultural issues. In other words, as a result of an interdependent world, it then became in our self-interest, not as part simply of some moral cause, but in our self-interest to regard ourselves <coughs> as affected by what was happening in a different part of the world. I actually have the Chicago speech here if you want me to refer uh, to it. I have it too, and um, I have referred to it. And, uh, it's quite important, I think, to make this point. It is an important speech. Yeah, because it, if you read the speech, you will see very clearly that the basis for what I'm saying is not that I now believe that we should apply, rather than a, a test of national interest, a moral test, I mean, I think there are moral issues to do with, with dictators and so on. What I was saying was that from now on, in the new world that's developing, we should realize that it's in our national interest to understand that the problem in a different part of the world can come back and hit us in ours. And the reason why I was so strongly in favor of action in Kosovo, action incidentally to rescue an essentially Muslim population, from persecution by a country that was a Christian country. The reason was not simply that I, I, I felt affronted, as I think people shouldn't and did do, about the, the prospect of ethnic cleansing, but also because I was convinced that the consequences of allowing such an action to go unchecked would never stay at the borders of the Balkans. So that's the basis of it. And when we then come to the Texas speech, it is not that I suddenly say, now, we're, we, we, now it's regime change rather than WMD. On the contrary, you, you quoted a passage. Um, I then go on to say this. Um, we cannot, of course, intervene in all cases. But where countries are engaged in the terror or WMD business, we should not shrink from confronting them. Some can be offered a way out, a route to respectability. I hope in time that Syria, Iran, and even North Korea can accept the need to change their relationships with the outside world. A new relationship is on offer. But they must know that sponsoring terrorism or WMD is unacceptable. And then I go on to deal with Iraq. As for Iraq, I know some fear precipitate action. They needn't. We will proceed as we did after September the 11th in a calm, measured, sensible, but firm way. And then I go on. But leaving Iraq to develop WMD in flagrant breach of no less than nine separate United Nations resolutions, refusing still to allow weapons inspectors back to do their work properly, is not an option. Right. Now, I then go on to describe the brutality of Saddam, but then I come back to the issue of WMD. So for me, the issue was very, very simple. It was about the need to make absolutely clear that from now on, you did not defy the international community on WMD. I'd like, if I might, also to make one, one other point, because I've read, obviously, a lot of the evidence that's, that's been given to you. I think there is a danger that we end up with a, a very sort of binary distinction between regime change here and WMD here. 
The truth of the matter is that a, a regime that is brutal and oppressive, that, for example, has used WMD against its own people, as Saddam did, and had killed tens of thousands of people by the use of chemical weapons, such a regime is a bigger threat if it has WMD than one that is otherwise benign. So if you were to look at Iran today, the reason why I take and still take a very hard line on Iran and nuclear weapons is not just because of nuclear proliferation, it's because the nature of the Iranian regime makes me even more worried about the prospect of them with, with a nuclear device. So you were making this dual argument at the time with regard to Iraq, both about the nature of the regime and about WMD. And as you quite rightly say, when you got onto Iraq in that speech, as on other occasions, you made that dual argument. Um, but of course, in a recent television interview with Fern Britton, you were asked, if you'd known then that there were no WMDs, would you still have gone on? And you replied, I would still have thought it right to remove him. So even without the WMDs, you were saying in December, um, very recently, that you would still have thought it right to remove him. And what I'm trying to grope for is precisely that point. Right, well, let me um, deal with the Firm Britain I interview. And um, Sir Roderick, even uh, with all my experience in uh, dealing with interviews, um, it still indicates that, that, that uh, I've, I've got um, something to learn about it. This was an interview, let me just explain, that was um, given um, some weeks before your inquiry began. No, no, we'd been going for some weeks by the time we started no, no, the in July. the actual interview was given oh, I see. some time It was before. recorded. It was, it was recorded, recorded some before, time. before July of last year. Well, no, not before July last year, but before you began your public hearings. In November. And the, the, yeah, and the point, exactly. And the point that I'm making is very simply this. I did not use the words regime change in that interview, and I did not in any sense mean to change the basis. Obviously, all I was saying was that you couldn't describe the nature of the threat in the same way if you knew then what you know now, because some of the intelligence about WMD is shown to be wrong. It was in no sense a change of the position, and I just simply say to you, the position was that it was the breach of the United Nations resolutions on WND. That was the cause. It was then, and it remains. So in April, this is my final point before I hand over, uh, of 2002, you were not taking the view that the need to change the regime in Iraq should be the main driver of your strategy because the situation on WMD essentially hadn't changed very much over the previous three or more years. No, no sorry, the, the, the position on WMD had changed dramatically as a result of September the 11th. The facts on WMD had not changed. The perception of the risk had changed, but not the risk itself. Yes, look, one of the things that you, you always have to do in this situation, you're absolutely right to, to draw attention to it, is you have to, you know, when you're um, charged with the responsibility of trying to protect your, your country, and that should be the job of the Prime Minister, you have to take an assessment of risk. Now, my assessment of risk prior to September the 11th was that Saddam was a, was a menace, that he was a threat, he was a monster, um, but we would have to try and make best. If you'd asked me prior to September the 11th, did I have any real belief in his good faith? No, I didn't. Did I really think that a new sanctions framework was going to do the trick? No, I didn't. On the other hand, precisely because the consequence of military action is so great. For me, the calculus of risk was, well, look, we're just going to have to do the best we can. After September the 11th, that changed. And that change, incidentally, I, I still believe is important for us today. Look, it's the reason today, as I say, I do take such a strong line on Iran or any other nation that tries to develop WMD. We cannot afford, in my view, and I, look, other people may have different views, but in my view, we cannot afford the possibility that nations, particularly nations that are brutal, rogue states, states that are, take a, a, an attitude that is wholly contrary to our way of life, you cannot afford such states to be allowed 
to develop or proliferate WMD. My colleagues are going to come back in more detail to this later on because it is crucially important and I apologize for, as it were, interrupting the flow at this stage, but I think it is time that I pass the bat on to Baroness Preshaw so she can carry the story forward a bit before we get back in more detail to the theme of WMD, if you're content with that. Mr. Yeah. wanted to say something. Just before Baroness Preshaw comes on, um, <coughs> The government last night declassified two documents. We weren't proposing to um, put them up on the website because in themselves they only tell a very small part of the story. But since our witness has referred to one of them, we shall now put both up on the website. They are declassified. <coughs> Thank you. Baroness Prashad. Thank you. Mr. Blair, I now want to pick up the, uh, the more detailed developments in policy, uh, particularly uh, at the beginning of uh, 2002 because it was, I think, eight years ago to date when President Bush told the Congress in his annual State of the Union uh, address about the axis of evil. And I think to your two advisors, uh, Mr. Jonathan Powell and Sir David Manning, said that they sensed there was a shift in emphasis, uh, particularly when regime change had actually become an active policy for the USA. Because although it had been on, mm. uh, there had been a, a Iraq Liberation Act and it was a policy, but it wasn't an active policy. It had actually became an active policy at that stage. When you sense this shift in policy, what was your response? Uh, if you can briefly tell me, and then I want to go on to the preparation for the Crawford meeting. Well, I would say that the, 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 the shift really happened straight after September the 11th. Mm -hmm. I mean, I, I think if I may just quote from the, straight after September 11th, what, what I actually said on this, this issue. Um, when I reflected on the terrorism, um, the, we know these groups of fanatics capable of killing without discrimination. The limits on the numbers that they kill and their methods of killing are not governed by any sense of morality. The limits are only practical and technical. We know that they would if they could go further and use chemical, biological, or even nuclear weapons. We know also that there are groups of people, occasionally states, who will trade the technology and capability of such weapons. And then I go on to say, you know, we've been warned and we should act on this warning. Yes, so but, 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 I would say it's not really about the President Bush axis of evil speech or anything else. I think after September the 11th, it was clear this whole thing was in a different framework. Yes, but my point was, how did we intend to respond to the change, uh, the shift in the American policy? Not the shift in your thinking, which we've heard earlier, but how did we intend to respond to that? We intended to respond by saying, from now on, we have to deal with it. So that's, that was... So the, the preparation for the meeting at Crawford that took place at Chequers, I think, uh, was a preparation meeting for Crawford and according to Alistair Campbell's diaries, you told Chequers meeting, it was regime change in part because of WMD, but more broadly because of the threat to the region and the world. That's true? Yeah, I mean, I think these things were, were, were sort of conjoined, really. I mean, the fact is that it, it was a, an appalling regime, and we couldn't run the risk of such a regime being allowed to develop WMD. Can I just make one point here, which I think is quite important as well? Of course, it was President Clinton in 1998 Indeed. That, that signed the Iraq Liberation Act, and that policy of regime change became the policy of the government. But, as I say, I'm aware of that, because it became more active, as I said. Yes, but can I just make this point, because I think it's very important. If you study the detail of that act, the reason he comes out for regime change, President Clinton, is because of the breach of United Nations resolutions on WMD. And so... There is a way I think you can, you, you can get a, a sense, and some, some of this has come in the evidence, as it were, the Americans are for regime change, we're for dealing with WMD. It, it's more a different way of expressing the same proposition. The Americans, in a sense, were saying, we're for regime change because we don't trust he's ever going to give up his WMD ambitions. We were saying, we have to deal with his WMD ambitions. If that means regime change, so be it. So it wasn't... That, that we kind of came at this from completely different positions. So in preparation for this meeting at Chequers, what kind of conclusions did you reach and what advice were you being given by your advisors? Well, the, uh, basically, we were 
obviously now going, you know, we'd had the military action in Afghanistan. It was obvious that the American system, indeed our own system, were now going to look at this WMD issue. Um, and there was advice on options as to containment and regime change and so on and so forth. So all those options were being explored. Um, and as I say, following that meeting and before I went to see President Bush, there was quite an intense interaction on this whole issue that Sir Roderick was raising with me about smart sanctions, because I needed to get a, a sense whether this policy was, a, was, was really going to be a runner or not. But why was the Chief of Defense Staff present at this meeting? Because it was very obvious that the American system um, certainly wasn't going to rule out military action. And, you know, from a very early stage, I could see coming down the track, I mean, straight after September the 11th, frankly, that there were going to be some very difficult decisions about this in the future. So one of the things that I always tried to do, particularly if we were, if military action was even a possibility, and the paper had made it clear it was a possibility, um, to get the chief of defense staff right alongside the discussion and, and the planning and, and, and the policy. And what advice did he give you at that meeting? Because I think you'd asked uh, the Foreign Secretary and the Defence Secretary to produce papers. Yes, the Defence... And, and, and these papers were discussed. But what advice did the Chief of Defence Staff give you at that meeting? Well, he was laying out, again, various options um, on the military side, and he was expressing his view. I think Mike Boyce told you about this in his, his evidence, that... that you know, no, indeed, American actually, system. Mike uh, Boyce doesn't remember being at that meeting, <laughs> although it is in, in Alistair Campbell's diary. So I'm afraid we don't have that information. Well, I mean, I remember him being at it. <laughs> um, uh, and as I say, we got the, the paper from the, um, from the Ministry of Defence, and that was looking at the various options. But, you know, one of the things that was happening at this time, and I think it's quite important to in, re reflect on this, is that... This was very quickly becoming the key issue. People were moving on from Afghanistan. It was always going to be on the agenda once you had September the 11th, and as I say, a different sense from everybody that we had to act. And um, so we, we, we had a, you know, a, a perfectly good discussion about it. And obviously, I think from the defense point of view, um, what CDS and the Ministry of Defence were concerned about was to make sure we got alongside any planning that was going on and did it as quickly as possible. And was the Foreign Secretary at that meeting? I believe he was, but let me go back and, and, and check. Because we heard from Jack Straw about the advice he gave you in, in advance of that meeting, which is the one that ought to be referred to. And, and, uh, but we have heard that while there might have been some private differences at the time between you and the Foreign Secretary over the desired final objective, where the regime change was the objective. You were agreed on the tactics, namely that it would be essential to go to the United Nations because without that it would be possible, not possible, for the cabinet or anyone else to support military action. Is that a correct? Yeah, absolutely, Baroness. I mean, I think the other thing that was very important to me at this time was um, to try to get the international community on the same page with the threat and how we dealt with it. And, you know, straight after September the 11th, people came together behind America. But I was very aware right from the early stages of this that although the American mindset had changed dramatically, and frankly mine had as well, when I talked to other leaders, particularly in Europe, I didn't get the same impression, really. And so one thing I was really anxious to do, because we put together a coalition on Afghanistan, was to try and put together a coalition again to deal with, with uh, Saddam Hussein. And therefore, the U United Nations route wasn't, it wasn't just that it was important for all sorts of political le reasons, legal reasons, and so on. It was, I mean, to do with the internal politics of the UK. It was also important to me because I didn't want America to feel that it had no option but to do it on its own. So are you saying to me that that was the kind of the agreed policy with which you went to Crawford, on the eve of Crawford? Is, is that what you intended to achieve at Crawford? I mean, what we intended to achieve at Crawford, frankly, was to get 
a real sense from the Americans as to what they wanted to do, and this would be best done between myself and President Bush, and um, really to get, then get a sense of how our own strategy was going to have to evolve in the light of that. Now, can we then come to Crawford? Because uh, you had you know, a one-to-one -one discussions with President Bush without uh, any advisors present. Can you tell us what was decided at these discussions? There was nothing actually decided, but let me just make one thing clear about, about this, that one thing that is really important, I think, when you're dealing with other leaders is you establish, a, and this is particularly important, I think, for the Prime Minister of the United Kingdom and the President of the United States, you, you establish a, a close and strong relationship. You know, I had with President Clinton, I had it again with President Bush. And that's important. So some of it will, you will do in, in a formal meeting, um, but it's also important to, to be able to discuss in a very frank way what the issues were. And as I recall that discussion, it was less to do with specifics about what we were going to do on Iraq or indeed the Middle East, because the Israel issue was a big, big issue at the time. In fact, I think I remember actually there may have been conversations that we had even with, with Israelis, the two of us, whilst we were there. So that was a major part of all this. But the principal part of my um, conversation was really to try and say, look, in the end, we've got to deal with the various different dimensions of this whole issue. I mean, for me, what had happened after September the 11th was that I was starting to look at this whole issue to do with this unrepresentative extremism within Islam in a different way. And I wanted to persuade President Bush, but also to get a sense from him as to where he was on that broader issue. So what you're suggesting is that you were having general discussions in terms of getting the views across to each other, trying to understand and establish a rapport and a relationship. Yeah, but also, you know, frankly, from his But during the course of these discussions, do you think you gave him any commitments? The only commitment I gave, and I gave this very openly at the meet meeting, was a commitment to deal with Saddam. Now, so we you deal were with at the... one that you had to deal Absolutely. with? Absolutely. And that wasn't a private so, commitment. That so, was a public commitment. So you were agreed on the end, but not on the means? We were, well, we were agreed on both, actually, as it, as it came to finally. But we were agreed that we had to confront this issue, and that Saddam had to come back into compliance with the international community. And as I think I said in the press conference with President Bush, the method of doing that is open. And indeed, he made the same point. I just wanted to make one other point about this. This was about six months from September the 11th. And one major part of what President Bush was saying to me was just to express his fear, actually, that if we weren't prepared to act in a really strong way, then we ran the risk of sending a disastrous signal out to the world. But there is, uh, so many people believe that you entered into a firm commitment because some undertakings were given that you will be with him no matter what, whatever the circumstances. I mean, I think it's important that these discussions were taking place without anybody being present to understand what commitments or did you make to him? And why is there a feeling that this was quite a critical meeting? Well, I, I honestly, uh, I can't ex explain why people have come to a view that there was some different commitment given, because I, I you know, read from time to time people saying things that this is what was agreed at this meeting. What was agreed was actually set out in a very private note from David Manning afterwards. And what I was saying to President Bush and I wasn't saying this privately, incidentally, I was saying it publicly, was we are going to be with you in confronting and dealing with this threat. There was no, <laughs> I mean, the one thing I, I, I was not doing was dissembling in that position. In fact, I actually have here, I think, at the press conference that President Bush and I gave afterwards, we talked about, I think it was Israel actually came up first, but then we went on to Iraq. And President Bush says, the Prime Minister and I, of course, talked about Iraq. We both recognize the danger of a man who's willing to kill his own people and harboring and developing weapons of mass destruction. And then goes on to say that he's got to, to effectively prove that he's, he's in compliance. And I then say, um, you know, it's always been our policy that our, Iraq would be a better place without Saddam. I don't think anybody should be in any doubt about that for all the reasons I've given. 
Um, and you know the reasons are to do with the weapons of mass destruction, also deal with the brutality and repression. I'm so sorry, Mr. Can you go slowly? Could, because could you slow down I'm so sorry. Yeah. My apologies. Um, so what I say in, is, and you know the reasons to do with weapons of mass destruction, also to do with the appalling brutality and repression of his own people, but how we proceed in this situation, how we make sure that the threat that is posed by WMD is dealt with, that is a matter that is open. So, and I'm going to describe the UN resolutions. So the position was not a, a, a covert position. It was an open position. And of course, what subsequently the debate was about in July and then in September at the crucial meeting. But, but, but before we move on to that, hmm. I mean, that's what you were saying. But what did President Bush understand, you think, you, you meant by that? Because we heard from Alistair Campbell about, you know, the tenor of your, of your correspondence with him. But what was his understanding? What did he take it to mean? I think he took it to mean what I'd said, both at the press conference and, and in the meeting, which is that we would be with them in dealing with this threat. And um, how we dealt with it was an open question. And even at that stage, of course, I was raising the issue of, of going the UN route. Now, your chief of staff told us that at Crawford and, uh, and subsequently, you did not set any conditions for Britain's support for the US, but that your approach was to say, we are with you in terms of what you're trying to do, but this is a sensible way to do it. We are offering you a partnership to try and get to a wide co coalition. But other witnesses who were also involved in the decision-making process have told us that you set a number of clear conditions for, of, for our support. Which of us, which was it? It was the former. Look, this is an alliance that we have with the United States of America. You know, it's not a contract. It's not, we do this for you, you do this for us. It's an alliance. And it's an alliance I, um, say to you very openly, I believe in passionately. I had been through with President Clinton, Kosovo, and just let me emphasize to you, 85% of the assets we used in Kosovo were American assets. I had real difficulty persuading President Clinton that it was right to go all the way on Kosovo. And he was in a really difficult position, and it was an immensely courageous decision he took, because the American people were saying to him, look, this place is thousands of miles away from America. Let the Europeans deal with it. It's on their doorstep. And it's important to understand but, this. But Sir Christopher Mayer did say that, you know, you were saying yes, but, but the but wasn't being listened to. Well, uh, I actually don't think Christopher Mayer was there at the critical meeting. But he had correspondence. He was briefed well, and all of that. He was talking about a, a wider period yeah, in 2002, not just about one meeting. Yes, but the, the, the fact is, at that meeting, and it's, I think the other evidence that's been given to you, particularly by David Manning, is very clear about this. We were setting out a position, and as I say, that position was not a private position, it was a public position. But I, I was just explaining about the American Alliance because it's important, and it's important in understanding my thinking on this. So I had been through this process with President Clinton when he, with a lot of courage, had committed America. September the 11th happened. I never regarded September the 11th as an attack on America. I regarded it as an attack on us. And I'd said we would stand shoulder to shoulder with them. We did in Afghanistan, and I was determined to do that again. Right. Now, I think it, the term used by Jonathan Powell was that you said that for technical reasons. So granted, you partly for technical reasons, you set out for the US the issues you believe needed to be tackled for the policy to be pursued successfully. But I think at Crawford, you did discuss UK participation in US military planning. Now, when you discussed that, what conclusions do you think President Bush took from the meeting about your commitment of dealing with Saddam Hussein through military action? Well, I think what he took from that was exactly what he should have taken, which is that if it came to military action, because there was no way of dealing with this diplomatically, we would be with him. And that was absolutely clear, because as I'd set out publicly, not privately, <coughs> we had to confront this issue. It could be confronted by a sanctions framework that was effective. For the reasons I've given, we didn't have one. It could be confronted by a UN inspections framework. We'll come to that. Or alternatively, it would have to be confronted by force. And I was going earlier, but I won't uh, 
do it, but I'm very happy to make available. The comments I'd made even prior to September the 11th, 2001, um, because we'd been through this with Saddam several times, 1997, 1998, and so on and so forth. Um, you know, the fact is force was always an option. What changed after September the 11th was that if necessary, and there was no other way of dealing with this threat, we were going to remove him. So would you say that the commitment that you gave, let's say, for te tactical reasons, kind of became an assumption in, 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 in Washington, and then to some extent reduce your uh, leverage for, for, for negotiations? When you say, for, did you say for tactical reasons? That, that is what Jonathan Powell was saying. Well, it wasn't so much for tactical reasons. I mean, what I believed was that if you wanted to make um, a real change to this whole issue, and again, this is very important to understanding certainly my strategic thinking, but I think the strategic thinking of many people who looked at this issue. And I would probably have a far greater understanding of it today, actually, than, than even back then. What I believe we confronted was a new threat that was based not on political ideology, but on religious fanaticism. It was a complete perversion of the proper faith of Islam, but it was real and active. And they demonstrated their intent to kill very large numbers of us if they possibly could. What I was trying to set out, not for tactical reasons, but for deep strategic reasons, is what did we need to do to make an, a successful assault on this, this ideology that was so dangerous? And therefore, the Middle East peace process for me was not a kind of tactical thing. It was absolutely fundamental, still is in my view, to dealing with this issue. OK, I'm gonna, I think Sir, Sir Roderick wants to come in. You said a moment or two ago that you had agreed with President Bush not only on the ends, but also on the means. But the Americans actually had a different view of the means in that they were already planning military action and they had an explicit policy of, of seeking regime change. I mean, did you at Crawford actually have a complete identity of view with President Bush on how to deal with Saddam? Well, we were, of course, pushing the UN route. So the American, the American view was regime change as I say, because they didn't believe Saddam would ever, in good faith, give up his WMD ambitions or programs. And you were insisting, ultimately successfully, that this should be done through the UN route. So actually your view of the means was actually different from theirs because they would have been prepared, they weren't that keen on the UN route. You had to persuade them very hard. We did have to persuade them, although I think it's fair to say that even at that meeting, President Bush made it clear um, America would have to adjust policy if we let, if Saddam let inspectors back in and, and the inspectors were able to function properly. Now, another thing you... And, and it's only if I can just point this out, at several occasions then over the next few months, President Bush made it clear to me that if the UN route worked, then it worked, that we would have had to have taken yes for an answer. You equally had said to him, as you've just repeated, and as Alistair Campbell said earlier, that if it came to military action and there'd been no way of dealing with this diplomatically, that you would be <coughs> with them. If we tried the UN route and it failed, um, then my view was it had to be dealt with. We'll come back to the question of where that left you in terms of, of your legal base <coughs> quite a lot later on, um, because I think it's best we take that as a single subject in its own right. I think it'd be easier for both of us. Just one more point arising from Crawford, but not just from Crawford. Uh, you said, you reminded us, that, that the Arab-Israel problem was in a very hot state at Crawford. You said you may even have had some conversations with Israelis from there, and obviously it was something that you, it was a large part of your conversations with, with President Bush. Um, and I think it's right to say, indeed Jack Straw said it, um, that you were relentless in trying to persuade the Americans to make more and faster progress on the Middle East uh, uh, peace process. Um, ultimately, Jack Straw said it was a matter of huge, in his evidence the other day, it was a matter of huge frustration that we weren't able to achieve something which you had been seeking so strongly. Now, Given the support that you were giving to President Bush, saying, I stand shoulder to shoulder with you, um, why didn't he repay that support by acting more decisively on 
the crucial issue of the Middle East peace process? Well, first of all, as I say, I think we, we should certainly, in order to understand my mindset, avoid this language that you're sort of trading this policy for that policy. I mean, I would not have done Iraq if I hadn't thought it was right, full stop, in respect of the Middle East. Um, however, I believe that resolving the Middle East, I mean, it's what I work on now, is, is immensely important. And I think it was difficult, um, and this is something I've said before on, on, on several occasions, it was difficult to persuade um, President Bush and indeed America, actually, that this was such a fundamental question. The Americans tended to regard these issues as somewhat separate. Now, in mitigation of that, we did eventually, although later than I wanted, get the roadmap adopted, and the roadmap was extremely important. Um, secondly, however, and I, again, I know more about this now probably than I would have known then because of the work I do now, I think truthfully with the intifada still raging um, in, in Palestine, it would have been pretty difficult to have got this thing back together again. However, having said that, no, I mean, I was relentless and I was always very frustrated about it because I, I believed then and I believe now that one, these are not um, divisible problems. It's one problem with different facets and one major facet of the whole problem is this um, Israel-Palestine conflict, not because, incidentally, um, the existence of Israel has provoked this conflict. I totally disagree with people who say that, but the resolution of the conflict would have an enormously beneficial impact on the relations with, with uh, the Muslim world. And I think, if I recall rightly, you were arguing very strongly throughout 2002 to the White House that making progress on this problem, as you say, it wasn't a question of a trade-off. It was because achieving progress on this was going to make a huge difference mm. to opinion in the region, to the reactions in the region, to the reactions in the Muslim world, if it came to the point where you had to take military action against Iraq. So as you've just said, these two things were linked together. But yes. the Americans were not able to see the logic of this in the same way. Well, it was a... Um it was a debate that continued, and I think, you know, you, you've got a point, actually, uh, Sir Roderick. I think that they, they never, uh, this is something, I think it's different with the American system um, now, and I think it was different, actually, at the end of President Bush's time, in fact. I mean, the reason he launched the Annapolis peace process was, was because of this. But I think there was a, there was a tendency to see these things separately, and I regarded them as, as I say, all part of the one, um, the one thing, and, and you know, yes, I mean, I, I said this at the time, and I would say it now. I mean, I, I wished we would have made better and faster progress on the But you on didn't Israel make Palestine. it a precondition with Bush. No, because it wouldn't be right to do that either. I mean, the, the, you, you should only take the action in respect of Iraq if you think it's intrinsically valid in its own terms. Um, having said that, you know, as I say, my whole construct was to get as broad a coalition as possible. And I thought if we managed to get the peace process really pushing forward, we were more likely to get a broader and deeper coalition. But surely you must have said to him, look, this thing's only really going to have a chance of working well if we can make this progress down the Arab-Israel track before we get there. Well, I was certainly saying to him, I think this is vital. And I think this was yeah. a, I mean, this was a, you, you could describe me as a broken record through that period. And, and actually after September the 11th, I think that straight after September the 11th, again in the statement to the House of Commons, in the speech I made to my party conference in uh, the end of September 2001, you know, I, I had and I have a view. Um, it's why I think if we want to deal with Iran today, and you've got very similar issues than the ones we're discussing here, which is why learning the lessons of this is so important. Again, in my view, you, we are far better placed to deal with Iran if the Israel-Palestine issue is moving forward. But was President Bush then just taking it for granted? When you said this is vital, was he just taking it for granted that we were going to support him on Iraq anyway? We were beginning now to join them in military planning. You'd said you were going to stand shoulder to shoulder with him. And so we would be there anyway, even if he didn't uh, push hard and get the progress that you were asking for on the Arab-Israel question. 
Well, when you say we would have been there anyway, I mean, we were wanting to go down this UN route, and I think if we hadn't gone down the UN route, it would have been very difficult indeed. However, in respect of the, the Israel-Palestine um, issue, look, it, it's, you know, it's there and in the record as to how important I thought it was. Um, to be fair to him, he would say that getting the Israelis um, to agree to the roadmap now, admittedly, this didn't happen until, I think, April 2003 was a, was a major step forward, and it was a major step forward. It's still the governing document for the peace process today, and I can assure you it was a big push um, to get that agreed, me with him and him with the Israelis. Um, but there was also, as I say, the Intifada was going on, the Intifada being the, the uprising and the Palestinian side, so Israel was, you know, it was, very, it was a difficult situation. Israel was losing a lot of people in terrorist attacks, there were retaliation against the Palestinians, there was a And this was inflaming, obviously inflaming emotions in the region. So when it actually came to the time that the coalition took action, um, did this disappointing lack of progress, notwithstanding the belated publication of the uh, uh, route map, how much of an element was that in the difficult reactions from the coalition's point of view in the region and in the Muslim world to the action that was actually taken? How much did it contribute, do you think? I think it's a difficult, it's a difficult question, really. I mean, I, I don't know that it fundamentally would have altered things. But, but if I put it the other way around, it would have been much better if you'd got well, that progress. That was why I was arguing for it that the entire time. For it. But um, having said that, I think that had we once um, the conflict occurred and gone into Iraq, had we been able at that point to drive forward, um, I think that issue would have been taken care of. And just to say, well, because I may not get another chance to say it about the reactions of Arab leaders in the region, I mean, most of them were glad to see the back of Saddam. Now, what they worried about was the consequences of doing so, but there was no great support. In fact, when as he is now King Abdullah of Saudi Arabia, when he was then the Crown Prince, and launched the Arab Peace Initiative in 2002. I think Saddam was the one leader to come out and denounce him. Um, he paid money to the families of Palestinian suicide bombers. I mean, he was a menace on the Middle East peace process, too. But having said all of that, yes, of course, it would have been better if we'd, if we'd had the Middle East peace process moving forward. The only thing I say in defense of President Bush was that it was a very difficult moment in that process. You know, if you were trying to do it today, it would be a lot easier than 2002, right in the middle of the Intifada. But it was pretty disappointing to you that we couldn't push that one further down the road. I was always disappointed and frustrated yeah. on this. Okay. Um, yeah. I think I should. Well, I think this is probably the right moment to take a break. Um, if we break now, um, maybe come back um, at just about five past, if that suits you. Good. Thank you. Prime Minister drawing on his experiences there as a Middle East peace envoy to offer some further analysis. We'll be back straight after the break. Airport parking might look pretty boring, but to us at Holiday Extras, every car park tells a story. Take this yellow car, turned out without booking, got charged full whack. Whereas this blue one, booked in advance with Holiday Extras, and saved nearly 60% on the gate price. It might be boring to book your airport parking in advance, but you could save up to 60%. Holiday Extras. We take the hassle, you take the holiday. If you have a medical condition, are you sure it's covered by your travel insurance? You can be with All Clear, even me with my heart problem. All Clear is the UK's specialist insurance provider for travellers with medical conditions. <laughs> You'd see a specialist for your condition, so before you splash out on travel insurance, see the specialist All Clear. Free phone 08000 28 95 28 or go online and give your travel plans the All Clear. Long ago, my ancestors suffered the terrible grab famine and were forced to live home in search of new life in Russia. <laughs> they did not go through all that to give you a quick deal on your car insurance. Compare the Mirka.com, compare the Market.com. Simples. It used to drive me mad living with old two legs. You could never hear the door. Or the phone. 
Hello? Mind you, it took me ages to get the message through. I tried everything to get him to Specsavers. That did it. Of course, it was over the moon afterwards. Because he got two digital hearing aids for the price of one. And Specsavers gave him a free pair of glasses, too. At least he's invested some of the hundreds of pounds he saved wisely. I'll just go and bury this. I may be some time. Call Specsavers on 0800 121 7766. I was walking through a reception. The floor was wet with no warning signs. I fell and seriously injured my knee. At first I was frightened that it might be very expensive to claim, but the National Accident Helpline was so helpful they promised my case would be settled on a no-win, no-fee basis. I received £5,000 and I was really pleased. If you're worried about claiming after an accident, Call the National Accident Helpline now. Call 0800 556 557. No! You believe more than footprints as they travel through life. Our daughters, they're gone. What if they could come back? <laughs> what kind of sick, twisted stuff are you doing here? You can see your daughter again. Isn't that worth whatever price you have to pay? She's a perfect copy. Copy a soul. Brand new Caprica. Starts Tuesday from 9 with a double episode, Sky One HD. After getting on for a couple of hours, an hour and a half or so, a questioning for Tony Blair. The uh, first break in his six hours of questioning, that's the scene outside the QE2 centre, a reducing number of protesters, down to about 200 now, still well policed. Let's reflect on the events of the morning so far with our political correspondent, Joey Jones, who's been monitoring proceedings. Uh, what did you pick up, Joey? What's really caught your ear? Well, it's quite a long session, obviously, Colin, as you say, but the, the panel are obviously anxious that Tony Blair, because of the time pressing on them, shouldn't be able to get into any long uh, political speeches, so they are chipping in on him quite regularly. Uh, I think you could see at the beginning that he was obviously quite tense, understandably, because this is a highly charged affair, and actually it was noticeable that Sir John Chilcott, even once Tony Blair had sat down, kept him waiting with some lengthy introductory remarks and then an almost interminable question from Sir Roderick Lyne as well, and I think you can understand Understand if the nerves did show very, very, very slightly. If we just look at Tony Blair at the beginning, watch his hands almost imperceptibly. They are, I just think, shaking there. You've got the close up uh, that you can see. And if we just move on to the next shot as well, where he's emphasizing a point again, that single finger emphasizing, but you could just see uh, a bit of a, a, a shake there as well. Uh, I will let Adam obviously comment on the detail of the substance. I do think the one area where he did get onto a sticky wicket was when Tony Blair was discussing an interview interview that he did with Fern Britton that was broadcast by the BBC in December where he said that he would have thought it right to remove uh, Saddam Hussein even had he known at the time that WMD would not be found. This is Tony Blair's explanation of that. I did not use the words regime change in that interview and I did not in any sense mean to change the basis. It was in no sense a change of the position and I just simply say to you the position was that it was the breach of the United Nations resolutions on WMD. That was the cause. It was then and it remains. So he says that the WMD uh, issue was the motivating factor for war and he did not mention regime change. Well, listen to what he actually did say in that interview. I would still have thought it right to remove him. I mean, obviously you would have had to use um, and deploy different arguments about the nature of the threat. So Tony Blair in his evidence today says he did not mention regime change as a motivating factor and yet he did say, as you heard from that quote, I would still have thought it right to remove him. I think the big question is whether or not that, that whole point of what he was trying to do was aimed, the key principle, at removing Saddam Hussein and that's what the inquiry team have been getting at. Yeah. Of course as a lawyer he would say he didn't use the exact phrase regime change and I suppose he'd be right up to a point. Joey, thanks very much indeed for now. Well the former Prime Minister talked heavily about how September the 11th was a watershed in relations with Iraq. Up to September the 11th we thought he was a risk but we thought it was worth trying to contain it. The crucial thing after September the 11th is that the calculus of risk changed. If September the 11th hadn't happened, mm. our 
assessment of the risk of allowing Saddam, any possibility of him reconstituting his programs would not have been the same. But after September the 11th, and if you'd like me to now, I'll explain what a difference that made to the thinking. After September the 11th, our view, the American view, changed and changed dramatically. Well, Sky's political editor, Adam Bolton, watching the hearing and listening to the hearing in Westminster. Adam, some very close questioning, not for the first time, from Roderick Lyne, who Tony Blair uh, referred to by his Christian name, notably. Yes, and there was a, a little bit of a, a joke between them about the uh, classification uh, of documents, uh, Roderick Lyne saying with a smile, uh, uh, just been classified by the government which you were elected to lead. Uh, but uh, I think it's fair to say uh, that, as Joey was saying, those exchanges over the phone Britain interview and one or two other uh, times do show uh, that the uh, committee is on its mettle. And also we're seeing today uh, Tony Blair's main line of defence. I mean, repeatedly, no, the absolutely key point was WMD. Uh, intelligence turned out to be wrong, but it was still WMD, he said. Uh, and uh, uh, also what he's saying is that people are perhaps being a little bit simplistic uh, in talking about what he says is a binary distinction uh, between regime change here and WMD there. He is basically arguing, as we heard in those extracts, that after 9-11 uh, had shown what, if you like, bad people, Islamic terrorists would do, that they would kill as many people as possible using whatever technology was at their disposal, that the issue of bad or dangerous regimes getting WMD uh, was at a new level uh, and had to be dealt with. Now, uh, as Jerry was saying, he didn't really have an answer on that Fern Britain point, uh, admitted really that the, mis the interview was a mistake, saying that he still had something to learn hmm. about interviews after all this time. Uh, he tried to argue that he'd given it earlier on, uh, before the committee focus. Well, that's not really much of an excuse. And in the end, he just dismissed what he said then and said, listen, uh, it was about WMD at the time, uh, whatever I may be saying subsequently. And that, I think, could develop into a bit of a problem for him as the questioning goes on, uh, because he also made this interesting point uh, about Britain insisting on the UN route and about George Bush agreeing to go down the UN route, although many in the American administration uh, didn't see the need for that. But then he did say, if we tried the UN route and it failed, then my view was uh, that it still had to be dealt with. That is Saddam Hussein and WMD. Now, I think a lot of people will be pressing Tony Blair later on on what he meant by it failed. Did he mean uh, that the UN route failed to give the green light uh, for going to war, which, of course, would put him in all sorts of legal trouble? Or did he mean, as I suspect he'll argue, that if the UN route failed to disarm the threat from Saddam Hussein, then it would have to be dealt with anyway? Uh, and, and, and this, I think, shows how we're likely to see this uh, evidence develop over the course of the day. He looked slightly peaked at one stage. Roderick Lyon was saying, you know, how much collective cabinet responsibility was there in this, or at least how much discussion of the substantive issues were there, who got to see all the important papers. And he said, you know, Blair said, Robin Cook, uh, Claire Short, th these were critics in cabinet who were robust in arguing the case for and against. Yeah, quite skillful uh, the way that he introduced Robin Cook, who, of course, uh, in a sense, is, is the, now the hero of the anti-war movement, uh, uh, having resigned from the cabinet. How he mentioned Robin Cook, and what he mentioned Robin Cook as saying was Robin Cook was worried about Iraq uh, not obeying UN resolutions. Uh, likewise, uh, he called Claire Short, who also resigned from the cabinet ultimately, uh, for saying that sanctions were a bit were counterproductive. So he was clearly trying to say, listen. Uh, there may be people who we now see as being critics of uh, the war who at the time were as worried as I was indeed feeding into anxieties uh, about the threat. Uh, and the same goes uh, for Jack Straw, who tried to paint himself as a very reluctant warrior before the inquiry. Uh, Tony Blair again stitched him into the ongoing arguments. But also a really fascinating ins insight, I thought, when he started talking about Kosovo, uh, when he said, Basically, he said, listen, I pushed Clinton further than he really wanted to go, put him in a very different position on committing to Kosovo. And the implication was that he therefore felt in the Iraq situation uh, that, as it were, Britain owed something back. Now, that wasn't picked up uh, by the questioners, but it's now there on the record.
He obviously knows a lot of the focus is going to be on the, the meeting with President Bush nearly a year before the invasion at Crawford, Texas. And he actually said, you know what, look at what I said in a speech the day after that meeting. I think he said it was in Chicago. You'll know better than I do, Adam. And seemed to be giving a context that separates it from Crawford. Yeah, now that was, it actually was in Texas at uh, Texas A&M University at College Station, where he did talk about regime change in the general context. And he, of course, made it clear that there was ultimately regime changing in Kosovo and elsewhere. And he had been uh, involved uh, in regime change in security situations. But uh, he uh, wanted to distinguish that general philosophical speech at the uh, George Bush Senior Memorial Library from uh, the... Um, specifics of what went on at Crawford, which we haven't really uh, got into that much, although we've had a long diversion uh, about uh, Middle East policy at the time, which was dominant, and that was the meeting where George Bush Sr. signaled that he would no longer work with Yasser Arafat, then the Palestinian leader, and uh, Mr. Blair had no alternative but to go along with it. But, I mean, that, that is a diversion, because what Mr. Blair is also saying is, listen, I have been talking about this at the conceptual level for a long time, uh, going back to 1999 and his famous uh, Chicago speech, which ironically uh, was largely written by one of the people examining him on the panel, uh, Sir Lawrence Friedman, <laughs> uh, about uh, the right uh, to intervene preemptively uh, in, in, in regimes. Uh, so he's saying, philosophically, I was there already, i.e. I wasn't pushed into this by the Americans. And he's also uh, gone over one important document, which, if I understood Sir John Chilcott right, has now been declassified and put on the website, which is that there was a March 2002 option paper as to where the Iraq situation might drive the British government. And in that, uh, he's saying uh, right from the start, there was always the possibility of the military option. Uh, again, what he's really saying is, look, there was a British decision-making process which was separate from uh, the American uh, decision-making process, even if it ended up in the same place. And also, of course, I thought there was one moment probably above all uh, when Tony Blair was playing uh, to the cameras, and in particular, I think, uh, the foreign cameras and the cameras in the United States, uh, when he talked about uh, the special relationship. Uh, this is an alliance, not a contract. Uh, it's something I believe in passionately, uh, making it clear that he certainly is not going to resile uh, from that aspect uh, of uh, the uh, lead up to the war. Adam, thanks very much indeed. Much more from Adam throughout the course of the day and the rest of Tony Blair's evidence to the Iraq inquiry. I'm talking there also about the separation, whether there was much of a separation in the decision-making process between America and the UK. A lot of the people protesting outside the QE2 centre don't believe there was, think that Tony Blair was George W. Bush's poodle. Ursula Errington's outside with those demonstrators. Numbers dwindling, but still noisy, Ursula. Certainly the numbers have dropped since this morning when there was maybe three or four hundred. There's probably only about 200 now, but they are from all areas of the country. I've spoken to people who've come down from Scotland for this and also to a lady that I have with me now who's come down from Liverpool today. She's a student, uh, Rachel Boothroyd. Rachel, can you explain to me why you wanted to come down here today? I just think it's extremely important to show that this war hasn't been forgotten by people in Britain and that people who, you know, did vote for us and particularly to Tony Blair, you know, in this country, they need to be held accountable for what they've done because up to a million people have died and we're not going to forget that anytime soon. But this kind of protest wasn't effective before the war. How can it be effective now? I don't know if you can say it's not been effective because, I mean, like the speakers were saying before, everything that's come forward in terms of even this inquiry is because of the action taken by Stop the War Coalition. So it's not something that they're going to pull out straight away. They're not going to admit whose fault it was straight away. And much like they're not going to admit that it was an illegal war, even though it was. But I think step by step we are making progress and people will be held accountable. There has to be. The evidence that we've been hearing from Tony Blair inside uh, that building behind us today is that it was his conviction that there were weapons of mass destruction. That was his motivation for going to war. Uh, it wasn't about regime change. What do you make of that? Well, first of all, a couple of weeks ago, he even admitted in an interview to the BBC, had there not been, you know, even if he'd known there were no weapons of mass destruction, he would have gone there anyway. So I don't know how he's maintaining that. Secondly, you cannot go uh, to war with a country, commit an aggressive act like that just on a conviction. That's why 
why we have institutions, that's why we've got the UN. He went without the second um, resolution from the United Nations. It was an illegal war and it's not enough to say, well, I believed, you know, it, it was, you know, justified because we, we, we don't work like that. We have international law and he went against that. Rachel, you have one question, say, to put to Tony Blair. What would it be? I will, I would, I would, why he didn't come out to the front and face Blair. He thinks he's in this war. Why didn't he come out and face all these people? But I would demand that he answered all the questions in the people's dossier. And I think that only then that that's really what I'd ask him to do, to be honest. Rachel, thank you very much for your time today. Well, as you say, the numbers are dwindling. We have had speeches, though, from George Galloway MP and Jeremy Corbyn MP. Uh, this has been uh, well supported in that uh, the statements that have been made here and the chanting continues outside the building. Hard to know if perhaps Tony Blair can hear it from where he's sitting towards the back of the building behind me. But certainly this crowd won't be going anywhere until they say they see Tony Blair leave here today. Well, Ursula, thanks very much indeed. It's possible former Prime Minister Tony Blair might be looking from one of the high windows from the QE2 to take a look at those protesters outside bearing the, uh, the posters there. These are pictures from earlier. Gordon Brown and President Mahmoud uh, Abbas, the President of the Palestinian Authority, uh, meeting at Downing Street today. Uh, worth reflecting, of course, that the next big guest of the Chilkut Inquiry will be the serving Prime Minister, Gordon Brown. There are those who are keen to establish as the man in charge of the money, in a sense, what role he had in terms of those cabinet discussions leading up to the war. A uh, couple more minutes, we guess, until the inquiry reconvenes and Tony Blair continues giving his evidence. Let's just go back to Adam Bolton, our political editor, to get a sense and do some guesswork, Adam, about what will be coming up, what big questions are yet to be addressed. Well, it's rather easier to follow this session than previous evidence sessions because Sir John Chilcott did outline the five areas uh, that he wants uh, to have questions on today, although it has to be said uh, that we're a quarter of a way through the allotted time uh, and we haven't even got off the first of those five topics. Uh, what they are going to now move on to is the specifics uh, of, or if they stick to their schedule, uh, the specifics of the uh, meetings in 2008 two uh, in Crawford and then following that in Camp David in September uh, of uh, what was agreed between Britain and America about going to war. They've touched some of that and then uh, again if they stick to Sir John Chilcott's own schedule uh, they're going to move on to the diplomacy in 2003, uh, the attempt to uh, unsuccessful attempt to secure a second United Nations resolution uh, and then of course ultimately the decision that even without that second uh, United Nations resolution it was legitimate for Britain uh, to commit itself to use force alongside the Americans. That, uh, I think, will be uh, more than enough to take us up to the lunch break, uh, when after that uh, they're going to go into areas which no previous inquiries have looked at, and so I think these are very important. Uh, the deterioration of the security situation in Iraq after uh, the invasion, particularly the uh, uh, immensely high uh, toll of violence in 2006-2007, uh, and then also an interesting one at the end, uh, Sir John Chilcott said he wanted to discuss was how the British government supplied strategic direction. In other words, what he's basically saying is, uh, uh, was the British government simply uh, a tag on to what the Americans wanted to do, or was there genuinely uh, a serious input of British thinking uh, into Iraq and uh, uh, the way in which the country uh, developed after the invasion? That, that is the schedule for the whole day, but I think probably for most people uh, the nub, if you like, of, of, of the protesters, as we see from that banner there, is the suggestion that Mr Blair lied or was in a conspiracy of some kind uh, with George Bush. And I think, although Mr Blair has already tried to preempt some of these questions, uh, that is an area where I'd expect the uh, uh, inquiry to feel they've got to deal. Some of those protesters you mentioned, Adam, the Stop the War Coalition and their fellow travellers, 2003, hundreds of thousands of people on the streets of London, around the world, equally large demonstrations as well. But politically, uh, the potency of Iraq within UK politics, it's slid way down the agenda, hasn't it? 
Well, I'm, I'm not so sure about that, Colin, actually. There's a, a new opinion poll today uh, from Politics Home which suggests that uh, many people do think that this was the responsibility of the new Labour government, that the new Labour government does need uh, to be held to account on that. And, and my own feeling is, although, of course, the Blair government was re-elected in 2005, that this whole question of Iraq really has festered uh, in the public mind. And, of course, it's live because of Afghanistan now so this Adam. inquiry committee really has a job to do to clear up that mood here we go again Adam thanks well thank you everyone let's um, resume and I'll ask Baroness Prashar to open the questions thank you Chairman. Uh, Mr Blair before break uh, you said that the military options were discussed at Crawford Yes, it was obviously a possibility that um, military action would be the outcome of, of what was going to happen, and so there was a, um, a general discussion of the possibility of going down the military route, but obviously we were arguing very much for that to be if the UN route failed. Okay. I think for reasons we'll come uh, on to later, I think you were being pressed by the Ministry of Defence to decide in autumn 2002 what scale of package the UK will be prepared to contribute to the event uh, in the event of military action. I think we've also heard that there were essentially four possible military packages under consideration, uh, with the main discussion focused on the two larger possible packages, uh, the key issue being whether we should contribute um, an armoured division. And I think your chief of staff told us that the MOD had advocated the largest package the large land force option because they felt that this was important to their relations with the US military and also because they felt it would help army morale. Now, as you well know, a decision to commit troops to battle put individual soldiers in harm's way and therefore cannot be taken lightly. How do you weigh the risks of troops involved in a large scale land operation as opposed to the one of the other packages? against the advice you were getting about the importance of military relations with the US and the morale? Um, Baroness, the first, the first thing to do is to work out whether you, you, you believe that you're right to be in this at all. Right. Then the next question is, if you are right to be in it, what is your level of, of support? And in any occasion, and I, I ended up in several occasions taking military action, Kosovo, Sierra Leone, Afghanistan, Iraq. The first thing I, I do, in the sense, is to say to the, the military themselves. And maybe be specific about Iraq, because I'm asking in terms of, you know, how did you weigh up the risk that two troops involved in the situation yeah. in Iraq? As I was just explaining, when I, when I come to take this decision, the very first thing I do is I ask the military mm -hmm. for their, their view. And their view in this instance was that they were up for doing it um, and that they would preferred to be right at the center of things. Now, that actually, I, I'm not hiding behind them because that was my view too. I thought if it was right for us to be in it, we should be in it there alongside our principal ally, the United States. I thought that in Afghanistan and I thought that in Iraq also. So that was your, your view too. So you, you were at one with what you what was what you were being uh, advised on. Correct. Did President Bush at any stage request a particular form of scale uh, of the UK contribution? No. He, he very much left this to us to decide what we, we wanted to do. But I had you know, taken a view that this was something that if it was right to do, actually it mattered to have Britain there. And it, it mattered not, not simply for reasons to do with the it mattered, armed forces. But, but, the, but the scale mattered because you know, uh, there were different ways in which we could have contributed. But did it have to be at the large scale that we committed ourselves to? It, it didn't have to be. You could have chosen one of the other two options. There were three basic options. And why did you choose? Uh, you were advised, but you were of that view. Why were you of that view? Because if you believe it's right and you're going to do it, my view was that it's best for Britain to be in there right alongside. And I say that because I regarded this whole issue as a threat to our security, as well as a threat to the security of the United States of America. It's not simply that I value the alliance, although I do value the alliance. And as I always say to people, you can dis 
Distance yourself from America if you want to, but you'll find it's a long way back. I believe it's a vital part of our security. And I also believe this, that if, if we think it's right, we should be prepared to play our part fully. But the reasons given by the Chief of Defence Staff was about the relations and the morale. But was there a question of how much influence we'd be able to exercise if we contributed a large scale? It, it wasn't so much that. I mean, it's a matter of common sense, obviously, if you're, if you're there you know, with a bigger um, uh, force alongside the, the Americans than otherwise, then, then, then of course you'll be more intimately involved. But that's not really the reason. The reason was to say, here we have this, this situation in which we believe there's a threat, America believes there's a threat, um, we're going to act jointly, we've acted jointly before, we're going to act jointly again. And it, it doesn't part derive from the importance that certainly I attached, and, but I hope the country does, to the American alliance, and also to the fact that our armed forces, and it's the thing that's extraordinary about them, mag magnificent about them, they are they're prepared to do the difficult things. So you're saying it was driven by your sense of what was the proper UK contribution to policy? Correct. And influence wasn't, wasn't an important part of it? You, you didn't and shouldn't do it for influence. Although, as I say, it stands to reason if you're making a bigger contribution, you're, you're, you're going to have more of a say. Right. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Richard. Um, perhaps I can turn now to Sir Martin Gilbert. Martin. Mr. Blair, I'd like to turn now to the issue of weapons of, of mass destruction. Once you decided in 2002 that it was essential to pursue the UN route, it was weapons of mass destruction rather than human rights or any other issue that became crucial to building the case and establishing a legal base for military action. We've been told by earlier witnesses that the information available to you on Iraq's WMD in early 2002, showed that the WD programs, that Saddam Hussein's WD programs, had changed very little since 1998, and also came with strong caveats about their reliability. Was that your understanding? Yes, the, in, the principal intelligence um, in, and I think this has been disclosed in the, in the Butler inquiry, in March 2002 was that our knowledge was sporadic and patchy, I think, were the words, but it went, then went on to say, but it is clear that Saddam continues his program. So, Martin, can I just um, say one thing, though, in respect, again, of this, because it, it somewhat troubles me, this, this, this absolutely, um, as I say, almost binary distinction between regime change and WMD. It was always relevant to me because I think that it, 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 gives, it gives a different sense of the thread of the nature of Saddam's regime. The fact that there were, on some accounts, a million casualties in the Iran-Iraq war, 100,000 Kurds that had been killed, 100,000 killed by political killings. We'd had the Kuwait situation, um, where again, tens of thousands died the actual use of chemical weapons against his own people. So I think it's always important to remember, for, from my perspective, the nature of the regime did make a difference to the nature of the, the WMD threat. That actually is my, is my next question, and, and I put right. it in a, in a slightly different way, that given the information available to you and given these, these caveats, was there no other aspect of the Iraqi regime that you felt could serve as a better basis for the UN route, as a better basis for, for the legal legality of, of action? You, you mean in... In terms of, of all the things that you had described in your speeches and about Saddam's brutality and, and, and what you were saying just now about his use of WMD on Kurds, on Shia? I think I actually said, it may, maybe in the Chicago speech, maybe <clears throat> elsewhere, that there are many regimes that I would like to see the back of. Uh, but you can't just go through, I'm afraid, and remove all the dictatorships. I mean, people often used to say to me about Mugabe and Zimbabwe and uh, the Burma regime and so on. But you have to have a, a basis that is about a security threat. And so, yes, you're absolutely right. That, that, that my assessment of the security threat was intimately connected with the nature of the regime. When... Um, 
with, with the members of the committee actually done this, but when you actually read the descriptions of what happened when Saddam Hussein used chemical weapons in the Halabja village, and by some accounts as many as 5,000 people died through, through chemical weapons, there are people in Iraq today who still suffer the consequence of that. To me, that indicated a mindset that was horrific. It's horrific whether or not he then uses weapons of mass destruction, but if there's any possibility of him ever acquiring them or using them, it's a mindset that indicates this is a, a, a profoundly wicked, um, I would say almost psychopathic man. We were worried, obviously, that after him, his two sons seemed to be as bad, if not worse. So yes, it's absolutely true. This, this definitely impacted on our thinking. So you were contrasting, in a way, what was known about Saddam's past use of WMD. You were sort of giving that a weight and not giving the same weight to the, the doubts and caveats about the actual situation in, in early 2002? No, I'd say very much that we, we did give weight to that, and that's why by the time you get um, to September 2002, you've got a lot more information. Um, but it's one of the, the things that's most difficult sometimes, because people look at this in the light of what we know now. Saddam and weapons of mass destruction was not a counterintuitive notion. You know, he had used them. He definitely had them. He was in breach of, I think, 10 United Nations resolutions on them. And so, in a sense, it would have required quite strong evidence the other way to have been doubting the fact that he had this program. Well, Sir Lawrence Friedman will be asking you in a moment about the September dossier, but I'd like to just um, move on for the moment to another aspect, and that is you said on a number of occasions in 2002, and indeed in early 2003, that Iraq was a test of the international community's ability to deal with both WMD and terrorism. If I could just quote um, from your monthly press conference on the 18th of February 2003, the stance that the world takes now against Saddam is not just vital in its own right, it is a huge test of our seriousness in dealing with the twin threats of weapons of mass destruction and terrorism. Uh, can you tell us how you saw those links and, again, what evidence you had that there were links? Because, as you know, the Butler Committee has established that there weren't direct links at that time between Saddam and al-Qaeda. Um, the link was, was in my mind, at, 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 at that time, um, this, that there was a, a proliferation threat that was potentially growing, because we had Iran, we had North Korea, we had uh, Libya, uh, we had Iraq, obviously. I would put a lot of emphasis on the AQ Khan activities. My fear was, and I would say I hold this fear stronger today than I did back then, as a, res as a result of what Iran particularly today is doing. My fear is that states that are highly repressive or failed, the danger of a WMD link is that they become porous, they construct all sorts of different alliances with people, and yes, it's true, we did not have evidence that Saddam was, for example, behind the September the 11th attacks, and part of the difference between ourselves and the Americans is we were always saying we, we, we don't accept that. It is interesting, and this is referred to in the Butler report, however, that actually Zarqawi did go into Iraq, in fact, prior to the invasion. Now, when I look at, because I spend a lot of time obviously out in the region today, when I look at the way that Iran today links up with terror groups, and and this is a different topic for a different day, but I would say that a large part of the destabilization in the Middle East at the present time comes from Iran. The link between Iran having nuclear weapons capability and those types of terrorist organization, it's the combination of that that makes them particularly dangerous. So you're absolutely right, Sir Martin. You know, we, we were in a position back then where we were actually saying to the Americans, look, Saddam and al-Qaeda, it's two separate things, but I always worried that at some point these things would come together. Not Saddam and al-Qaeda simply, but the notion of states proliferating WMD and terrorist groups. I still think that is a major risk today. 
And was there, were there indications in the information you were getting that there were links, if not between, say, Al-Qaeda and Saddam, that there were somehow links between other terrorist organizations and him and his potential WMD? Well, there was obviously Saddam and the funding of Palestine, the families of Palestinian suicide bombers and so on. Um, I think what's very interesting, and we will come on to this later, but when you actually look at what happened in Iraq and what happens indeed in Afghanistan today, what happens in Yemen today, um, Somalia, many different countries around the region, there are very strong links between terrorist organizations and states that will support or sponsor them. And the reason why I think this is a particular danger today is because there are these states, Iran in particular, that are linked to this extreme and, in my view, misguided uh, view about Islam. So I think it is, we still face this threat today, in my view, very powerfully. And finally, in 2002, did you feel that this terror WMD link was also a potential threat to the United Kingdom? Yes, because for the reasons that I've given, I think that these, as had happened before, if, if Saddam, freed from sanctions, was able to pursue WMD programs, I, I was very sure that at some point we were going to be involved in the consequences of that. Thank you. Sir Lawrence, over here. I just want to follow up this question. Um, you've mentioned quite a lot about Iran. Um, you were reminded before the break uh, about President Bush's Axis of Evil speech in which Iran was mentioned along with North Korea as well as Iraq. Um, and I believe, uh, I think it's clearly in the documents and elsewhere, that in presentations of the problem of WMD, certainly when you get to the nuclear issue, Iran, Libya, North Korea, were put far ahead of Iraq. So given what you're saying about the Iran issue now, I wonder why Iraq was chosen rather than Iran. Absolutely, because they were the ones in breach of UN resolutions. If you wanted, I think I said this at the time, if you wanted to start somewhere on WMD, you started with the person who used them and you started with the person who was in breach of UN resolutions. Now, we decided to take a very, very strong view on this back then. And as a result of that, um, countries actually, I think, did adapt their behavior, at least for a time. I think um, Iran certainly did change its behavior to begin with in respect of its nuclear weapons program. Libya, as you know, at the end of 2003, gave up its WMD program. And that had a long history before. It, it, I'd been working on this for a long from time. President Clinton's time, but I think it fair to say there was something... They'd been rumbled on the AQ Khan network. They'd been rumbled on the AQ Khan network, but it was interesting when they finally gave it up, and it was at the end of 2003, we then discovered that actually they had a more extensive program than we had thought. And the AQ Khan, I think AQ Khan at some point in, within the next couple of years was then put under house arrest. North Korea went back into six-party talks. Now. I don't, one of the things that is most difficult in this whole area is people sometimes say to me today, well, it's not Iraq, it's Afghanistan, or someone else says it's Pakistan, or someone else says it's Iran, or today now, yesterday we have a conference on Yemen. I'm afraid my view is they're all part of one yeah, picture. But, but I just want to clarify, because it's, it's quite important what you've just said. Uh, as I understand it, you basically said, of course, there were a number of countries that were serious threats uh, and were further ahead, particularly on the nuclear side, indeed much further ahead, as it now turns out, on the nuclear side. What was important about Iraq is we had a route to get at them through the United Nations, so that it was partly for the exemplary effect that we had a route to deal with this, rather than necessarily it was the most important. In other circumstances, you might have gone to deal, say, with Iraq. We had to deal with all of them, but you're absolutely right. The reason why we focused on Iraq was of the history of UN resolutions being breached, and also, and I, I think this is a pretty important point, he'd used them. You know, probably not merely his own people, but thousands of people in the Iran-Iraq war. Indeed. 
But, and, and you've also indicated that um, what had changed since 9-11 uh, was the risk calculus more than the specifics of intelligence. Um, you now think you can go down the UN route uh, to get Iraq by focusing on their weapons of mass destruction. Um, does that not make the specifics of the intelligence on WMD more important than if it's just sort of part of this broader sense of the dangers of the, of the regime? That's absolutely correct, Sir Lawrence, and that's why um, it was important, obviously, we came under pressure and in the lead-up to the publication of the, the dossier in, in September 2002, we came under enormous pressure to, to say, well, what, are, what does our intelligence actually tell us? Um, and um, that's why between March 2002 and the actual publication and on the 24th of September 2002, we had further intelligence reports, and obviously the Joint Intelligence Committee was incredibly active during that period in assessing what the threat was and the evidence was. Now, this leads us naturally to the September dossier, and we've had a lot in these hearings uh, about the origins and production of the dossier, and I, I don't want to go into all of that now. But two issues do stand out. Um, the particular question of the 45-minute claim and the more general assertion that the intelligence was beyond doubt. Uh, the 45-minute claim is very specific but very controversial. Is it fair to say that, that the intelligence referred to chemical, possibly biological, munitions for short-range battlefield use, but that specificity was lost in the document? It's absolutely right that that was what it was to do with. Um, in respect to the 45 minutes, as you know, I think it's just worth pointing out, this, this was a headline, I think, in the Evening Standard newspaper the next day. And the Sun and the Express. Uh, I've said um, on many occasions, uh, not least to the Butler inquiry, it would have been better to have corrected in the light of the significance it later took on. But can I just point one thing out, Sir Lawrence? She did an analysis between the publication of the dossier on the 24th of September 2002 and the BBC broadcast at the end of May 2003, which alleged that we, Downing Street, had inserted this into the dossier, probably knowing it was wrong. Right. And then, of course, obviously, that then kicked off a huge controversy that goes on to this day. Between September 2002 and the end of May 2003, there were 40,000 written parliamentary questions on Iraq. It was mentioned twice. There were 5,000 oral questions. It was not mentioned at all. In the 18th of March, nobody mentions it. So, I can think of a speech where Jack, by Jack Straw in February where he does mention it. Uh, but all I'm saying is that I appreciate ex post facto, this has taken this on has a become, far greater significance than it ever did at the time. And I think it's taken on that significance possibly because um, it's taken as an indication of how evidence that may be pointed um, was given even more point in the way that the dossier was written. So it, it, we, there's a question about its impact, and we may agree that it was uh, an immediate impact, but it's uh, then uh, declined. But the fact of the way that it was developed and reported was misleading. It suggested that it was something more than battlefield munitions. Did, did you understand the, the difference between the 45 minutes relating to battlefield munitions and, say, a long-range missile? I didn't focus on it a great deal at the time because it was mentioned by me and then, as I say, it was never actually mentioned again by me. Um, and as I indicated to the Butler inquiry, in the light of what subsequently happened and the <coughs> importance it subsequently took on, it would have most certainly been better to have um, corrected it. However, if I could just make this point about the you know, where you quite rightly say, well, of course, it's not surprising it takes on significance because of all the, um, the controversy, quite rightly, over the, the intelligence um, that was wrong. It was for that very reason that we held the Hutton inquiry, which was a six-month inquiry, precisely into whether we had indeed inserted this from Downing Street into the dossier. And, of course, we didn't. And we, we, um, the, the 
JIC was the... Uh, I think it's been established that, the, that uh, in that sense, the, the dossier wasn't doctored mm -hmm. by uh, an improper insertion of false intelligence. It's more a question of how a particular bit of intelligence was in, interpreted and presented, losing its specificity and gaining a broader meaning. Uh, so just to clarify from what you said, you seem to be saying that you hadn't actually paid a lot of attention to this, so that when it appeared in the foreword, and the phrase is well known about the 45 minutes, you weren't particularly aware yourself that you were saying something that went beyond what the intelligence would really allow? Correct. And as I say, I mentioned it, I think, in my statement on the 24th of September, but I mention it without any great emphasis, and I, I, I mention, I think, in in reasonably sensible terms. But when, and, and you've already mentioned not just the standard, but a number of, of newspaper reports the next day headlined this. It wasn't just a question of it appearing uh, as one part of a long discussion. Um, presumably at this point, it must have struck you that something had, had hit home. Uh, were you at all concerned that in an issue of such moment, uh, that intelligence was get, rather, intelligence of a certain nature was getting an exaggerated sense of importance. You, you know, the thing that strikes me most now, when you go back and look at the dossier and how it was received, it was actually received as somewhat dull and cautious at the time. Yes, we've and, been told. Yeah. Um, you know, it really assumed a vastly greater importance at a later time, precisely because of the allegation, which was an extraordinarily serious one, that, that we, Downing Street, had deliberately falsified the, the, the intelligence, which, of course, we hadn't. I mean, the importance of the dossier, of course, is in terms, in part, of its immediate political impact. Uh, and no doubt you're right to say uh, the, the general view that this was telling us what we already knew. But if it was, it was saying something quite important, that we had detailed intelligence on Iraqi WMD that led you to certain conclusions. And therefore, in a sense, if, if it was considered uh, old news, it was because you'd already been successful in establishing that point of view. I, I don't think it was us that was um, successful in establishing that point of view. I think you would have been hard pushed to have found virtually anybody who doubted he had WMD and a WMD capability and program, because we'd been through this whole saga, 10 years of, of military action. As I say, I took the first military action in respect of Baghdad with President Clinton in 1998. So it wasn't that so much. And incidentally, I just point out that in the um, statement with the dossier, which I, and I think, to be frank, it was the statement people would have heard rather than the forward, I actually say specifically, why now, people ask, I agree, I cannot say that this month or next, even this year or next, Saddam will use his weapons. So the issue was not he's about to launch an attack. No, no I appreciate that. Yeah. Uh, I, what I'm trying to get at is the quality of the intelligence, because just to take an example, President Chirac, certainly in September 2002, seemed to believe uh, that Iraq had weapons of mass destruction. But I think he also said, but I've seen no proof. Um, and the issue that uh, is now important, because you've decided to go down the UN route, is that uh, that detail is going to be tested. Indeed, you had a press conference with President Yeltsin in October, uh, where he said um, he didn't believe in it. And you said, well, that's for the inspectors to find out. I think you did. So yeah, no, I, 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 I was merely um, um, reflecting on the fact that, uh, well, there's a whole issue to do with Russia and its view of how to proceed. There is indeed a, a view, but, but I, what I'm, the point, just to keep focused on at the moment, is that the, the actual quality of the intelligence that the British had and the Americans had was more important about whether this was a shared assumption, because we were now proposing, or you were hoping, indeed, as the dossier was published, the president had promised to take this through the UN route. So the quality of the information was important. This brings us to the, the uh, uh, yes, it's been pointed out to me. I, I said Yeltsin rather than 
It's Putin. Um, this is important. Um, the, we get to the forward. Uh, you said in the forward that the assessed intelligence has established beyond doubt that Iraq has continued to produce chemical and biological weapons. Now, you've already mentioned the, the JIC reports that were Apache, sporadic, limited, etc. Um, given that, uh, was it wise to say that intelligence is ever beyond doubt? Wasn't this setting yourself up for a higher standard of proof than uh, it might be possible to sustain? I think what I, um, what I said at the, in the foreword um, was that I believed it was beyond doubt. Um, what I believe the assessed intelligence has established beyond doubt is that Saddam has continued to produce chemical and biological weapons. I did believe it. I mean, that was the, and I did believe it, frankly, beyond doubt. And beyond alone, your doubt, but beyond anybody's doubt. Well, look, if you use, if I take him, for example, the words out of the even the 9th of March, 2002, or the March 2002 JIC assessment, it said it was clear that. Now, if I'd said it was clear that <laughs> in the forward, rather than I believe beyond doubt, it would have had the same impact. I actually think now, and this is incidentally, I think, a lesson that came out of the Butler inquiry, but I think it's relevant to this as well. And I, I said this at the time. Now, I would take government right out of this altogether. I would simply have published, if the intelligence services would be willing, for it, the JIC assessments, because they were absolutely strong and off on their own. And if you look at the dossier itself, and of course the dossier itself, if you just take the executive summary, and I mean, I won't go through and, and read it, but I, this executive summary wasn't drawn up by me. It was drawn up by the Joint Intelligence Committee, and they did it perfectly justifiably on the information they had before them. It's hard to come to any other conclusion than that this person has a continuing WMD program. And, I mean, we will come at a later point in this to the issue of what the truth was about Saddam, because the Iraq Survey Group, which is, in my view, an extremely important document, um, has actually resolved the conundrum and the riddle of what Saddam was up to. Um, and we, therefore, can see what happened. But if you go back to that time, if you read the executive summary and the information that follows, I can't see how anyone could come to a different conclusion. There were alternative, and this is possibly a problem, maybe another lesson. Um, intelligence is often described as joining up the dots uh, because your information is limited. Uh, and there was a very powerful hypothesis that allowed you to join up the dots in a particular way. But there were alternative hypotheses, and they were around at the time. So it's partly a question almost of due diligence. Was there a challenge to the intelligence? Are you absolutely sure that there isn't another way of explaining all this material? When your Prime Minister and the Joint Intelligence Committee is giving you this information, um, you, you've got to rely on the people doing it with experience and with commitment and integrity as they do. And of course, now, with the benefit of hindsight, we look back on the situation differently. But let me just say what was troubling me at the time was, supposing we put it the other way around, and it was correct, and I wasn't going to act on it. That was the thing that worried me. And when I talked earlier about the calculus of risk changing after September the 11th, it's really, really important, I think, to, to understand this so far as understanding the decision I took, and frankly would take again, if there was any possibility that he could develop weapons of mass destruction, we should stop him. That was my view. That was my view then. That's my view now. But this is a different standard to the one that you're going to have to take to the United Nations. Uh, and we'll come to that in a moment. Can I just, uh, just to conclude? on this for the moment, because we've got other questions to get to. I would just want to put to you, and this is a, uh, a comment made to us by Sir David Oman. Um, he observed 
that SIS overpromised and underdelivered. In some ways, were you too trusting of some of the material you were getting? Um, the most difficult thing when you're faced with a situation like this is that it all depends what happens afterwards as to how people regard your behavior at the time. And I've also been in situations where, for example, when we had the July 2005 bombings, where people were saying, well, look at this little snatch of intelligence here, or the Americans indeed, for September the 11th, they had entire congressional hearings into it. Look at this bit of intelligence here. And so your worry is not simply, is the intelligence correct so that I can act? Your, your worry is also, if it is correct, what am I going to do about it? And so I, I don't disagree with you at all. I think these things obviously now look, look quite different. And as I say, the Iraq survey group has resolved some of these um, riddles, frankly, as to what Saddam was, uh, was up to. But I think it was at least reasonable for me at the time, given this evidence and given what the Joint Intelligence Committee were telling me, to say this is a, a, a threat that we should take very seriously. Finally, just on this point, I think the Butler Committee referred to groupthink uh, as a phenomenon which is quite well known in these sorts of discussions, uh, where, let's say, the hypothesis that we've talked about is, is reinforced. Did you get a sense that the intelligence community were also reinforcing your hypotheses as well as it moving in the other direction? Uh, I certainly got a sense that they were. I think John Scullard, in his evidence to you, explained about he was firming up the, the, the assessments they made. But when we actually came to the November UN resolution, in fact, nobody disputed the issue of Saddam and <coughs> WMD. People disputed what we should do about it, and we, we can come on to all of that. But it really wasn't something that, that people disputed at the time. And, you know, it's just interesting. I was looking back over, over, the, um, over the debates that we, that we had on, on the, the publication of the, the dossier and just recognizing that, of course, everyone now has a different perception of this, but at the time, there were people saying to me, I don't want military action under any set of circumstances. There were also people saying, you're wasting time. You're not acting fast enough. Did I, just, for example, in the statement on the dossier on the 24th of September 2002, William Hague says, does the prime minister recollect that in the half century of various states acquiring nuclear capabilities, in almost every case, their ability to do so has been greatly underestimated and understated by intelligence sources. Estimates of or today of Iraq taking several years to acquire a nuclear device should be seen in that context, within that margin of error, and given that and the information sure, from sorry, sorry, could you go slowly? First, could you go more slowly? And secondly, I mean, th there is a difference between a statement being made by a member of the opposition, and it's clear that, that, that uh, the opposition at the time uh, did take the threat very seriously. I, keep, I come back, and I'm going to stop at this point. By going to the UN, where, and, and where the pressure would be for the inspectors to test this out, a higher standard of proof was now going to be required for these assertions. It was not, not good enough to have reasonable confidence on the basis of Saddam's past behavior, but you really did now to be very sure of your case. Absolutely. Of course, we should have been very sure of our case. All I'm saying is that all the intelligence we received in even after the September dossier was to the same effect. I mean, it wasn't against that. And the reason I simply was, I won't go, I'll spare the stenographer and not, not go back over reading out the quotes. What I'm saying to you, however, is that there were people perfectly justifiably and sensibly also saying, and this gives you some idea of the context of the time. Look, this, you, you can't sit around and wait for this. 
you know, you've got to, to take action and to take action clearly and definitively. And so one of the most difficult aspects of all of this in, in Iraq is that, you know, people often say to political leaders, quite understandably, they say, listen to the people. And what you find in circumstances of great controversy is that actually there are different views. And in the end, you have to decide. And I decided you know, that, that this intelligence justified our considering Saddam as a <coughs> significant and continuing WMD threat, and that we had to act on it. OK, I think Sir so, Martin. Uh, uh, Roderick, sorry, wants to come in. Can I just <clears throat> make a couple of quick queries to try to help us understand the why Iraq, why now questions. Um, obviously, we, like you, have read through the assessments of the JIC. Was the intelligence telling you that the WMD threat from Iraq was growing? Yes, it was, it was telling me that in two respects, because I know you've asked other yes. witnesses about this. And I just want to make this clear as to why I believed it was growing. First of all, there were the September JIC assessments that talked of continuing production of chemical weapons. So in other words, this was a continuing process. But secondly, and this uh, did have an impact um, on me at the time, although this particular piece of intelligence turned out later to be wrong. But at the time, obviously, we didn't know that. On the 12th of September, in other words, after the 9th of September JIC assessment, but before we did the dossier, um, I was told and specifically briefed about these mobile production facilities for biological weapons. So this was an additional and new factor. Um, and this was very much linked to whether and how Saddam might conceal his activities. And in terms of his nuclear program? In terms of the nuclear program, what was set out in the, in the dossier and set out in very detailed form, incidentally, were all the different items that he'd been trying to procure, which could indicate um, a continuing interest in nuclear weapons. But it would have taken quite a long time to get from that point to having a usable nuclear weapon. Well, he, he, here, here is the, the, the problem, Sir Roderick, and we face, again, this, the same, exactly the same problem in Iran today. If you say to people, well, how long will it take them to get a... Iran's much further down the track. Um, well, there's, there's debates about that, actually. But if you, if you ask people about the nuclear weapons capability, for example, in respect of Iraq, some people would say, Yes, if they're doing it on their own, it's going to take a significant amount of time, but it, you can foreshorten that time if you buy in the material. And so one of the reasons, and I, I, I emphasize again, this whole proliferation issue, and AQ Khan in particular, was that it always worried me that any of these countries, if they were so minded, could step up very quickly. Yeah, and it's get these ifs, isn't it? I mean, when Sir Martin Gilbert asked you about the threat to the United Kingdom, you said that if Saddam, uh, freed from sanctions, were to have been able to pursue WMD programs, you were pretty sure that the United Kingdom would have been involved, in which obviously you're right. But um, hadn't, at the time we're talking about, Saddam, he hadn't been freed from sanctions or from a pretty effective arms embargo or from all the other apparatus of deterrence. And other countries which were just as opposed to the idea of Saddam having WMD as us, and many of which were much closer to Iraq, clearly didn't agree that military action was needed or justified by the level of threat at that time. So they didn't accept the why Iraq, why now questions, or at least they didn't give two yeses to that. And I'm trying to work out why you did and they didn't. Well, there's a judgment you have to make. And, you know, you're right in saying um, if this and if that. But you see, for me, because of the, the change after September the 11th, I wasn't prepared to run that risk. I, I really wasn't prepared to were. take the risk. Well, that's up to them. But my view, um, the view of the US, I think the view of many other countries. I mean, after all, when the Iraq action took place, half of the members of the European Union were also with America. Japan was with America. South Korea was with America. But I think there's an interesting point here, because I think you're absolutely right to raise the judgment. And this, in the end, this is what it is. Mm -hmm. You know, it's not a, as I sometimes say to people, this isn't about a, a lie or a conspiracy or a deceit or a deception. It's a decision. 
And the decision I had to take was, given Saddam's history, given his use of chemical weapons, given the over one million people whose deaths he caused, given, given 10 years of breaking UN resolutions, could we take the risk of this man reconstituting his weapons programs? Or is that a risk it would be irresponsible to take? And I formed the judgment, and it's a judgment in the end. It's a decision. I had to take the decision, and I believed, and in the end, so did the Cabinet, so did Parliament, incidentally, that we were right not to run that risk. But you are completely right. In the end, what this is all about are the risks. And Thank you. the reason why it's so important, the, the point that you make, is because today we are going to be faced with exactly the same types of decisions. And we're going to have to make that judgment on risk. And my judgment, maybe other people don't take this view, and that's for, for, for the leaders of today to decide. My judgment is you don't take any risks with this issue. You've made that, I think, very clear. Um, Thank you. Sir Martin. I have one more question on, on intelligence. At the time of the September dossier, were there aspects of Iraq's WMD program that you knew of that could not be revealed to the public at that time? Um, I think practically everything that, that was relevant to this was in the, the JIC statement, you know, the, 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 the actual body of the, um, the dossier. Um, so I can't think of specific items, but I mean, it may be there were, there were various but, things. But that, with regard to the, the growing threat, this was something which essentially rested upon the, the information that was published in, in the dossier. Yes, and in particular, the information that came in shortly before the dossier was published. We're going to come shortly to the question of military planning. But I'd like, before we do, to put rather a more general question to you about presentation of government policy in 2002. When you were asked from mid-2002 whether the UK was preparing for possible military action, your public statement suggested that it was not. For example, you told the House of Commons uh, Liaison Committee in July 2002 when they asked, are we preparing for possible military action against Iraq, you replied, no, there are no decisions that have been taken about military action. Yet we've heard from other witnesses that while no operational decisions were taken on military action, a whole range of decisions were being taken about military options, including, of course, joint planning with the United States on a contingency basis. My question is, would it not have been reasonable for you, and, and indeed expedient, to, to have explained publicly much earlier than you did, that while the UK hoped for a peaceful outcome in disarming Saddam Hussein, we were also preparing for all eventualities, including military action. Well, it's a perfectly fair point, I think, Sir Martin. Let me just explain our problem, though. We had not decided we would take military action at that point. On the other hand, you couldn't say it wasn't a possibility. And you know, in the part that you've just read out, you'll notice I choose the words quite carefully. I see no, no decisions have been taken. And the trouble was people kept writing. They have decided they're going to they're off on a, a military campaign and nothing's going to stop them. So we were in this difficulty that had I said, maybe in retrospect, it's better just to, to say it. But had I said, yes, we're doing military planning, our fear was people would people would push you into a position where you appear to be on a kind of irreversible path to military action. That wasn't our position. Our position was we wanted to get America down the UN route and get a resolution through the United Nations. Now, because it was so obvious with the history of this that you couldn't be sure that, that the United Nations route was going, going to work. In fact, the likelihood is that it wouldn't. Um, nonetheless, uh, we had to do military planning for it. And yet several military witnesses have told us that the need for this secrecy was proving quite a, an impediment to various aspects of preparation. Didn't you have the, the skill to, to explain to Parliament what you've just said to me, that it, <laughs> we were still determined on the UN route and, and a peaceful resolution? 
Parliament can, Parliament can be quite a tricky um, forum in which to engage in a nuanced exercise, uh, is my experience after 10 years of Prime Minister's questions. But I mean, it's a perfectly fair point. And actually, towards the end of October, um, I think Jeff Hoon said to me, look, you've got to come and take certain decisions. And I just do want to emphasize this because it's very important. If at any point the military had said, look, you're really going to inhibit our ability to do this um, if we can't have visible planning, then obviously, and that's what happened in October, um, then obviously we would have had to have changed that. But my worry was you, you, you're going to be in a situation where people assume that which has not, in fact, been decided. So we had to, for prudent and sensible reasons, carry on doing this uh, military planning. We were doing it kind of as much as we could under the radar, as it were, um, but I, I can't frankly say it made much difference, actually, in the end, so it's a perfectly fair point you're making. Thank you. All right. I want to now move on to the diplomacy. Um, now, we've had a lot of evidence on the negotiation of Resolution 1441, clearly getting uh, President Bush to agree to go to the United Nations was a game changer in many ways because uh, it meant that your basic need in taking it forward in British politics had been met, that it had to go through the United Nations. Um, and we've heard a lot about the difficulties of the negotiations, the work mm. of Sir Jeremy Greenstock, and so on. And we've been through the resolution itself, in what some <coughs> might say is arcane detail. Uh, so we've done all of that. I'd like, therefore, to fast forward, if I may. You're meeting with President Bush in Washington on the 31st of January, 2003. Mm -hmm. um, was your main objective at that meeting to convince the president, that just as you had convinced him that it was important to go through the UN to get the first resolution, that now it was necessary to get a second resolution? Yes, the second resolution was obviously going to make life a lot easier um, politically um, in every respect. Um, <coughs> the difficulty was this that 1441 had been very clear, and I know you've gone through this in enormous detail with, with uh, Peter Goldsmith, but just to emphasize the point, it was a very strong resolution. It declared Iraq was a material breach. It said that it had fully and unconditionally and immediately to cooperate and cooperate with the inspectors and so on. And it was a strong resolution. It specifically mentioned the previous resolution, 678, 687, and so on. Um, but as, as, as you've heard, the truth is there was an unresolved issue um, because some people, some countries obviously, wanted to come back and only have a decision for action with a specific UN resolution specifically <clears throat> mandating that action. We took the view that that was not necessary, but obviously politically it would have been far easier. Um, so Sir Roderick will uh, be talking to you later about the legal case, but perhaps just to note that from the evidence we heard from Lord Goldsmith, uh, the last advice you had from him before you went off from Washington was that at that time he believed that the legal position was that we did need a second resolution. Correct. So, so there was that issue as well, and that was another reason why getting a second resolution would have been important, although Peter was not, I don't think, saying that that resolution had to be in those terms, but that you needed to come back for a further decision, as it were. Further decision, exactly. Um, and we've also heard from uh, Jack Straw that politically, at home, it seemed to be important to uh, get it because it would make life easy for you with parliamentary party, cabinet, and so on. Yes, absolutely. What, what was the president's view of the need for a second resolution? Well, President Bush's view, the view of the entire American system, was that by that time, Saddam had been given an opportunity to comply. I think the resolution 1441 said it was a final opportunity final to opportunity. comply. And he hadn't taken it. Indeed, what we now know is that he was continuing to act in breach of the UN resolutions, even after the inspectors had gone back in there. 
So the American view was, the American view throughout had been, um, you know, this, this leopard isn't going to change his spots. He's, he's always going to be difficult. And so that was their concern about the UN route, in a sense, was that they get pulled into a UN process. You never get to a proper decision, and then you, you, you never get the, the closure of the issue in the way that you should. The, the problem, um, obviously, from, from our perspective, was that we had gone down the UN route. We wanted to carry on going down um, the UN route. Um, but the Americans had taken the view, and in a sense, we took the same view of the Iraqi behavior up to that period at the end of January, that they weren't complying. So be clear, the president's view was that it really wasn't necessary. But was he prepared to work for one? His view was that it wasn't necessary, but he was prepared to work for one. Um, now, it's been reported uh, in the New York Times in 2006 that the president said at that meeting that the Americans would put the weight behind the effort, but that if it ultimately failed, military action would follow anyway. Is that correct? The, the, the president's view was that if you can't get a, a, a second resolution, because in, in essence, France and Russia are going to say no, um, even though, in fact, I don't think they were really disputing that Iraq was in breach of Resolution 1441, then we were going to be faced with a choice I never wanted to be faced with. Did you go then without a second resolution? And my view very strongly was that um, if he was in breach of 1441, we should mean what we've said. It was a final opportunity to comply. He wasn't complying. So you, your position at the time was that if you couldn't get a second resolution, you would agree with the Americans, go with the Americans on military action? Well, there was the, then the legal question, which was very important, because Peter had drawn my attention to that. So there were all sorts of factors that were going to be in play there. There was the political question as to whether we get the support for it. But my own view, and I was under absolutely no doubt about this, is that if you backed away when he was playing around with the inspectors in precisely the way he'd done before, then you were going to send a very, very bad signal out to the world. So your position at the time, end of January, was that politically, legally, for a variety of reasons, you would like a second resolution. Um, you thought it was very important to work for it. But if you didn't get it, you were prepared with the Americans to take military action, supposing the legal and political issues. Correct. My okay. view was that, that if, 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 in the end, you could not get a second resolution, even in circumstances where there was plainly a breach of Resolution 1441, and there was, and at some point we can go through the Blix reports, and you can we see will, from, we will yeah, from, from Blix himself was, was clear in each one of his reports, there was not full and unconditional compliance. We'll, and it, we'll, we'll come to that in a moment. Yeah. Um, it's also been reported, and I don't think this is a, a big secret, that you were informed that the start, proposed start date for military action at that time was March the 10th. Hmm. Is that your recollection? Um, Whether it was the, at the, that meeting or around about that time, certainly, yeah. yeah. The, the date eventually slipped by just over a week. but. Um, and is it also fair to say that the president was adamant that this military planning set the terms for the diplomatic strategy rather than the other way around? Um, well, this was a, a debate that continued, frankly. And you see, what I tried to do, as you, as you know, before the military action is I had one last attempt to get a consensus in the Security Council around a resolution I drafted with effectively with Hans Blix to lay down a series of tests that Saddam had to comply with. You see, the problem was this. There was no doubt he was in breach because he wasn't complying fully, unconditionally, and immediately. On the other hand, people were saying, well, but give the inspectors more time, which is perfectly you know, understandable. And I was thinking, how do we actually get to the point where you force people to understand, and in a sense, Saddam, finally, to decide whether he's going to comply or not. We're getting a bit forward, though you raise issues that are obviously important. Uh, and I think it is fair to say, at that time, 
the American view was that the military timetable, with a little bit of give, had to be adhered to. My, my point is, is simply this, this is the question, um, is from the end of January, you had perhaps six weeks, maybe more, maybe seven. How did you think you could get a, a resolution through in such a short period of time? And wasn't the danger of this situation that, um, in a sense, not only were you giving Saddam an ultimatum, but you were almost giving yourself an ultimatum as well? Well, it wasn't that, that, that um, I was giving myself an ultimatum, because our position had been clear. We had to resolve this through the UN. If we couldn't resolve it through the UN inspectors, we had to resolve it by removing Saddam. Um, what actually happened? was we had time enough to do it. The, the problem was very simple. In the end, after 1441, in a sense, France and Germany and Russia moved to a different position. And they formed their own pole that was a, a power, in a sense, that was essentially saying to America, we're not going to be with you on this. Well, again, we'll come to that in a moment. Just on the military timetable, I mean, again, we've, we've heard from a number of witnesses the American concern um, that it was unrealistic to keep the troops, once mobilized and deployed, uh, out in Kuwait, uh, in the Gulf, weather getting hotter, for uh, a prolonged period of time. So the military planning was, one way or, the, or another, bearing down hard on the diplomatic process. Y yes, that, that is correct, um, beca and, and in this sense. I think it's fair to say that the only reason why Saddam was having anything much to do with the inspectors at all, and they were getting dribs and drabs and more cooperation, was because he had 250,000 troops down there with all their machinery sitting on his doorstep. So you're always in a position where you've got to be very careful then. But, and you're, I think the, many of the witnesses have said this to your inquiry, not just the Americans. I think our own military were concerned if you then had months with the troops down there. Um, you know, as inspections went on, but nothing really was, was being resolved, I, I think that would have been difficult to have done. So in that sense, you, you're, you're right. Of course, it's always, you, you know, you've got to, you, you come to a point of decision. The only thing I would say to you is, and I think this is absolutely vital in understanding, again, the mindset at the time. Had Saddam, after 1441, in a sense, done a Colonel Gaddafi, if he'd come forward and said, right, I accept it. We're going to full and unconditional appliance. Here's the declaration. It covers everything we have. Um, come in, interview our scientists, take them out of the country and interview them if you wish. Uh, we are going completely to reposition ourselves. Had he done that, we would have been in a different situation. He didn't. I mean, he would have had a difficulty in that, though, isn't he? Doesn't he? Because if he had done that, he would have said, we have no weapons of mass destruction, because that, in fact, turns out to have been the case. But he wouldn't have been believed. Indeed, when, I, when the head of IEA uh, said at the end, uh, there's no evidence of a nuclear pro program, uh, Vice President Cheney said, you're wrong. The, 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 there is still a problem here that given the, the hypothesis and the mindset as you describe, it would have actually been quite difficult, given all his background, for Saddam Hussein to have been convincing on this score. Let me I totally understand the point you're making. Let me explain to you why, Sir so Lawrence, I don't believe it's correct in the end. If you look at the Iraq Survey Group report now, and this report, I mean, we'll get to the detail of it a bit later, but this report is very, very important indeed, because what it is effectively is what Blix could have produced had Saddam cooperated with them. And what that report shows is actually the extent to which Saddam retained his, his nuclear and deep chemical warfare um, intent and intellectual know-how. Now, what Saddam could have done perfectly easily is have provided the proper documentation, and he could have cooperated fully in the interviews of the scientists. But if you look at the, the report, one of the problems that the Iraqis had got themselves into is when they had dismantled a lot of this stuff, they had not maintained proper documentation. So you're almost in an audit trail.
problem here. Indeed, Jack Straw was raised this way when he was talking about why he thought there was stuff there. It goes back to the 1998 documents. Is actually it would have been quite hard in the circumstances and beliefs of the time for a convincing case to be made. Uh, I mean, I don't want to belabor this point, but... It, but, but, it, but it's it, a very important point, if, I, if, if you don't mind me yeah, no, it is. saying so. I'm happy for you to because, respond. Because actually, if you look both at the Blix reports, and we can come to the detail of that, and the Iraq survey group, he was deliberately concealing documentation. And what is more, he was deliberately not allowing people to be interviewed properly. Indeed, in December, 2002, this is after Resolution 1441, we received information, and this information remains valid, that Saddam called together his key people and said that anybody who agreed to an interview outside of Iraq was to be treated as a spy. Now, the reason for that is very simple, and it emerges from the Iraq Survey Group report. He retained full intent to restart his program, and therefore it was very important for him that the interviews did not take place because the interviews with senior regime members were precisely what it would have indicated, uh, the concealment and the intent. Indeed, and this indicates perhaps a problem going back to the dossier and the specificity there. If it had been said that there was a continued intent of Saddam Hussein to have a weapons of mass destruction program, then that might have, uh, that would undoubtedly have had a degree of credibility. But the problem was, that the specificity was that it was there, it had been reconstituted, and the weapons were there. Yes, but this is, uh, as I say, and I think Sir Lawrence, you're absolutely right, but this is absolutely at the crux of it. Indeed, what, it's, I mean, it's, a, it's a problem, and I do want to get on to, 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 to uh, Dr. Blix now, because it is a problem, uh, uh, and we discussed this a lot with, with Lord Goldsmith as well, is that it's true that the issue of material breach was around the question of um, non-cooperation with the inspectors rather than hiding particular weapons. Um, well, so, sorry, just, it's really very important to get this right. It is absolutely clear from the Iraq survey group, and indeed the Butler report deals with this, that he was concealing material he should have delivered up to the UN, that he retained the tent not merely in theory, but was taking action on, for example, dual use facilities that were specifically in breach of the United Nations resolutions. I'm not actually disagreeing that the, right. the, the, there were uh, significant elements of military uh, material breach in Saddam's behaviour. Um, I'm, this is really as much about the diplomacy and what's going on in New York as it is about what's going on in Iraq. To get a second resolution, which is where this, our discussion started, you needed the evidence that Saddam had not taken up the final opportunity. You need the evidence of the material breach. Now, where was this going to come from? Uh, who was going to provide the statement? Well, Blix and his reports were obviously the key documents here. Um, and you'll see from his reports, he goes through them, I think, on the 19th of December, then he's got one on the 9th of January, I think, then again on the 27th of January, then... He, he, so, right. he, it's important that he's providing his reports. Um, Correct. Was the strategy, as you discussed it around the time of the White House meeting at the end of January, dependent upon Blix being rather firm in his assertions of material breach, as he had appeared to be, in terms of at least talking about non-cooperation, he didn't declare material breach, but in his discussion of non-cooperation, in his January the 27th report. So were you sort of hoping, expecting, that he would reinforce your view by continuing to take that position? Well, the whole point was that his, his, his view was that Iraq was complying somewhat, but not fully and unconditionally. And as time went on, I became increasingly alarmed, actually, that we were just back into a, a game-playing situation with Saddam. I think we were, incidentally. I think it's very clear from what we know now that he never had any intention of his people cooperating fully with the inspectors. But I mean, it's just all just worth it no noting, um, in terms of what the inspectors could do, that he was able to report that they were dealing with the Al-Samud missile which actually, if you go back 
to the intelligence was the area where a step change in Iraqi capabilities had correctly been reported by uh, British intelligence and put in the dossier, uh, was the firmest bit of the threat. And that was actually dealt with by the inspectors mm -hmm. uh, in March. So it wasn't that this was necessarily a wholly passive role that they, that they were playing. No, that's true. And, and, and obviously, as the prospect of military action and the troop build-up was there, he started to give more cooperation. But I would just draw your attention to something that I think, as I say, is of fundamental importance. And that is that Resolution 1441, it, it decided in, in um, paragraph 5, Operation Paragraph 5, not just that he had to give unrestricted access to all sites and so on, but it specifically focused on the issue to do with interviews and but the, gave... But this was always a very controversial issue. I mean, Dr. Blix was always very reluctant to, precisely because of the risks he knew they would, they would be in, to take, them, to take them out. I mean, he was never himself that enthusiastic no, about that. Exactly, Sir Lawrence, but let me tell you, this is a really important point here. He wasn't enthusiastic. I used to have these comments, uh, conversations rather, with Hans Blix, where, where Hans would say to me, well, I agree we should, we should interview these people, but you don't understand. They, they, they may be killed, or their relatives may be killed. And I would say to him, well, what does this tell us about the nature of the person we're dealing with and the nature of his compliance. I mean, yes, he was. He kept saying to me, I feel deeply personally responsible if I ask for these interviews to be conducted outside of Iraq, because I believe these people may be killed. But that, to me, was not a... It was, a, it was an illustration of the problems uh, of dealing with Saddam Hussein. Correct. Um, on the 14th of February, when Dr. Blix gave a presentation to... gave a report, uh, which was not long after Colin Powell's very significant speech of the 5th of February. Um, were you disappointed by the line he was taking there, which seemed to row back somewhat from the position you'd taken on 27th of January? It wasn't that I was disappointed. I, w I was getting um, uh, confused as to what he was really trying to tell us. Because what he kept doing is saying, well, yes, there is a bit of cooperation here, but then there's not cooperation there. And what particularly struck me about the 14th of February Blix report, and this then had a huge significance in what I tried then to construct as a final way of avoiding the war, is on page 26 of his briefing, he deals with this issue of interviews. And he says that the Iraqi side of, because they're starting to move on interviews, because he's beginning to press on it, they have made a commitment that they'll allow it. But then when he actually comes to the interviews themselves, people are very reluctant yeah. to do it. But that's an inherent problem with this regime for the reasons that you've given. Correct. And we, and we, we knew that beforehand. Yes, but it's precisely the reason, therefore, why even if Blix had continued, the fact is he would never have got the truth out of Saddam and the leading people in the regime. The people who did get the truth out of him were the Iraq survey group. And what they found was that Saddam retained the intent. I know, but it's incredible. Well, but I think, we, I think we've got the idea that, that, that the intent was there. And, and, and the know-how. And the know-how, and, and, yeah. and this isn't an issue of disagreement. Right. Um, I'm sorry, Mr. Blair, did you want to make more of that, in fairness to you? I think we've taken the point. It's not in contention. Well, it's just... Sometimes, I think, and I'll do this very briefly, but sometimes what's important is not to ask the March 2003 question, but to ask the 2010 question. Supposing we had backed off this military action, supposing we'd left Saddam and his sons, who were going to follow him, in charge of Iraq, people who used chemical weapons, caused the death of over a million people, what we now know is that he retained absolutely the intent and the intellectual know-how to restart a nuclear and a chemical weapons program when the inspectors were out and the sanctions changed, which they were going to be. Now, I think it is at least arguable that he was a threat and that had we taken that decision to leave him there with, that in with the intent, with an oil price not of $25, <laughs> but of $100 a barrel, he would have had the intent 
he would have had the financial means, and we would have lost our nerve. Thank you. Sorry. You had a phone call with Dr. Blix on the 20th of February, um, and he's written about this, I think he's written about it again this morning. Um, we've obviously seen the record. Um, now, one of the things that people were commenting on by this time was that the smoking gun, as it's been called, that had been searched for had not been found. A number of uh, sites had been suggested and nothing had been turned up. Um, and I'm quoting what he said he said. Um, words to the effect, it would be paradoxical and absurd if 250,000 men were to invade Iraq and find very little. Uh, what was your response to that? My response to that was to say, what you have to tell us is as to whether he's complying with the resolution. Is he giving immediate compliance and full compliance or not? And his answer to that was no, but you never know. It may be that if we're given more time, he will. It was really arising out of that conversation that I worked with him to try and get a fresh UN Security Council resolution. I mean, I kept working on that right up until the last moment. As we know. But you, four days later, in fact, on the 24th of, of February, um, you tabled a draft resolution, um, which stated that Iraq had failed to take the last opportunity to cooperate. But at that point, Dr. Blix was not saying to the United Nations, to the Security Council, that his, his compare, they say, with the position of Richard Butler in December 1998, who was absolutely clear that he was not getting the cooperation he sought from Saddam Hussein. The last report that Dr. Blix had given had been that uh, he uh, was getting, in principle, cooperation on process. That's what he, he was saying. Now, you may disagree with that and think it's uh, not necessarily a, a proper interpretation of the, of the evidence that you could see, but that's what he'd said. Um, so that, you, in a sense, you're having now to make the judgment to the Security Council on material breach at that time without uh, the support of a statement by Hans Blick. That, explicit support? Well, whether he thought the action was justified or not, his reports were clear that the compliance was not immediate and the cooperation unconditional. It plainly wasn't. Indeed, actually, on his 7th of March document, where he was obviously moving further along the road, he says this at page 31. It is obvious that while the numerous initiatives which are now taken by the Iraqi side with a view to resolving some long-standing open disarmament issues can be seen as active or even proactive, these initiatives three to four months into the new resolution cannot be said to constitute immediate cooperation, nor do they necessarily cover all areas of relevance. They're nonetheless welcome. So what I felt was that we got to a situation where he was very much on the one hand or on the other. And here he was the decision we had to, to take, really, at this point. And, and I think in the light of what the Iraq Survey Group have found, I actually think this judgment was right, which is why, personally, I don't believe if Hans Blix had another six months, it would have come out any differently. We had to really f form this judgment. You know, if you've got a... A, a regime that you believe is a threat, in the end, you may choose, you may change them through sanctions, but they have to be sustainable. You may change them by military force with all the problems there is. The, the simplest way of change is that there's a change of heart on the behalf of